So I'm here with Richard Walsh. We're on our way to Canberra, so we thought we'd, uh, while we're chatting in the car, we might as well talk some real shit <laughs> <laughs> and do a bit of a podcast episode. So, um, yeah, so Richie, you know, you, okay, let, let's probably lead with the probably one of the, the high, highlights in terms of your working career in terms of the UFC, right? Yeah. So we'll lead with that and then we'll go back from there, right? But when you reflect on your time fighting, um, how, like what, what sort of emotions does that bring back for you? Like, do you think, do you, do you view it as a positive thing? Do you view it as a negative thing? Or, or like what sort of associations um, do you have? Positive, you but sometimes I think about it in more recent years, you know, since I've, I've stopped fighting and stopped training as much, I'm kind of, um, it's hard to reconcile that that was the same guy. Um, you know, and then, and I was thinking about it the other night, kind of what was driving me to, um, to be successful because we were talking about competitiveness and being competitive. And I was trying to think like, what was motivating me? And um, I always said to people, I didn't want to be the UFC champ, but maybe that's what, that's what kind of made me quit on the way is my, my goal was like, get into the UFC. And then once I got there, I, I kind of achieved that, ticked that, that goal. So yeah. then my motivation started to kind of dwindle a bit. And um, I think for me, that's, that's been similar in a lot of things in my life. But as I look back, um, yeah, it's certainly, it's strange, right? Because it seems like it was only seven, seven years ago since I was fighting, but it seems like 20 years ago. That's, yeah. that's kind of how it is. Um, and then, you know, life goes on and you become <laughs> as normal as it comes, just cruising through life. But I think once you've been a fighter and you've, ex- you've had those experiences, you stepped into the cage, that part of it stays with you for life. Yeah. And I, I guess, you know, we'll probably talk a bit more about this later, but, you know, life after fighting is, you know, when you, when you decide to, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, like, did you have any idea what you wanted to do after that? Not necessarily. I knew that I probably would be involved with the sport, um, just using like, you know, the simplest kind of explanation for that is, you know, I'm already in the industry. It just seemed very logical to me that once I finished my career that I'd be in coaching or I'd be something to do with sport, whether it was, you know, working for the UFC or whatever it was. And, and, um, but at the time, you know, when you, when you made that decision or when I made that decision, I didn't have anything lined up besides I already trained people, personal training, coached people myself the whole time through my career. So I always had that to lean on. But once the fighting was gone, the routine was gone. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really, it was a really tough time, right? In yeah. terms of you kind of trying to uh, recalibrate your identity and your, and your, <laughs> your self-worth, which is based around this routine. Yeah. You know, this routine is training two to three times a day. And I was pretty regimented in how I trained and, and what I did. And, um, yeah, to break that cycle was, was um, I don't think anyone can really prepare for that 100%. You know, I think one of the craziest things in life is we attach so much of who we are to what we do, right? And, Why you do know, you think that is? Well, you think about it like, you know, when you're, when you're growing up, right? You're a kid and then you're a student. And then it's like, you know, if you go on to, to study something else, you might be a uni student. That's right. Right? Or you might be, if you're going to work, you're an apprentice. If you're going to, like, say, you're going into a trade, right? Yeah, we're just, like, bucketing ourselves into we, a category. Yeah. Like, so, so all the way as we're growing up, we're sort of conditioned to be labeled as something. Yeah. And so, you know, what happens, though, is when you invest a lot of your time and energy and I think a lot of the sacrifices, right? Like, to be a fighter, you're sacrificing so much in life. Um, and so part of that sacrifice is that, you sort of feel like, yeah, that's, that's all I am, right? And so then, and, and you know, I, the reason why this resonates for me when, you, when, I, when I'm talking about, you know, you hang out the gloves in fighting is like, when I left the auto industry, like that was 17 years of my life, right? You know, granted, I did a whole bunch of different roles in those 17 years, but when I left, like, you sort of realize that, hey, you know, there's, there, there's only one reason the phone was ringing, and it's because people, you know, they want to engage with you because of what role you have, as opposed, and look, that's not everybody, right? Like, yeah, not you know, everybody. Not but everybody. But the majority. Right, but the majority of the of the phone calls that you would get, you know, is all because somebody would need something. Yeah. And that's not. I'm not saying that's a, a good or a bad thing. Like, obviously, you know, having those emotions of feeling wanted or feeling like you're you, you're doing something, right? Like, yeah. they're, they're good emotions to have. You need to feel like you're contributing somehow. But when you no longer have that, you really have to. I think we really have to work out, do I actually like myself or not, right? Like, I, I, like because it gets very fucking lonely, lonely right? And look, I, I, I'm fortunate that I was in a, in, in, a, in a later stage of my life where I've got kids and I've got family and, 
you know, I've got this beautiful support network and like, you know, credit to my wife, you know, she never was like, I'll go back and get a job. You can't like, sorry for the language, <laughs> but you know, like, yeah, oh, look, you know, but she, she was very much, you know, very supportive in the sense that, you know, like we we we've done, you know, we've done fairly well for ourselves. We can, we saved up a bit of money. We can, um, afford to sort of hang, hang for a bit while we work out what's next. Right. And then it's like, the big thing for her was that, you know, we wanted to have, we wanted to recalibrate uh, the time that we spent with family, right? And so that was one of the biggest things that would um, impact my decision coming back to work was like, how do I get the best balance here? Yep. You know, is automotive actually going to give me that balance that I wanted? And after I realized that it probably wasn't, like I had to sort of, it was pretty hard to let go, you know? Yeah. Like it's hard, I think it's, and, and you could probably speak to this in the fighting, right? It's a big decision to make. Well, it's just, uh, I think it was pretty similar. You kind of nailed it. It's hard to let go, right? You, you, there's like a piece of your soul, a piece of your whole um, identity, which is entwined with the sport. And, and like you said, you're, you're a high school student, you're a uni student, you're a fighter, you're a professional athlete, whatever that is. So that kind of consumes and it's all consuming, right? So yeah. you do start to kind of have those thoughts or, you know, as long as you're not a total, total shit bag, you have those thoughts like, you know, I've got a wife or I've got a girlfriend who's, who's been around with me on the journey, but most of the story um, that involves me is solely around what I want to do, right? Yeah. So certain things start to play on your mind a little bit as you start to progress and get, well, for me, towards my 30s, um, I started to think about marriage, kids, making money, you know? Um, and, and to be honest, when I stopped fighting, like, and I started coaching about two years later, when I was still fit, still sparring, I was like, this is the best I've ever been by a long shot. Like, when I was in the UFC, I did not technically know everything yeah. I should. Yeah. I was just kind of athletic, got there pretty quick. Um, and it was only several years later, then after that, I was like, oh my God, if I actually just knew what I was doing, um, it would have been a lot easier. But then again, I didn't have that motivation when I, when I challenged my mind to think, could I go back and do it again? The answer is no, I don't think so. Because it, it requires for me and for my uh, persona, it requires a, like a, a lot of work. Yeah. Like I can't cheat it. And I'd hate to go to a fight camp and know that I haven't done everything I can to be the fittest I, I can be, right? Yeah. Um, so that's a lot of work. And that's tiring. That's physically tiring. It's mentally tiring. Yeah, I paid the price mentally after my career. And then physically in my career from overtraining at the start of it before I knew what to do, you know, I totally smashed my hormonal system, endocrine system. And um, that has kind of like the cascade of effects, right, in your life. Yeah. So... Yeah, I think I'm glad that I have the introspection to uh, to kind of taking those lessons from martial arts and life and kind of distill them and have them now, but not to say that I don't look back on it to your first question and look at the highs. And it was actually just yesterday that I hadn't watched a, a fight of mine in several years, right? And I just pulled up, you know, I saw nine years ago you fought in Japan, say time for Super Arena, <laughs> and I pulled up the fight just to watch it and I, just to kind of look at who the guy was on camera fighting because yeah. I was like, that, you know, it's hard to reconcile that. That doesn't seem like it's you. No, no. Not to say that I still wouldn't, you know, have a crack, but <laughs> I'm not a fighter in that sense. Yeah. Out of curiosity, you know, do you remember uh, for you, you know, the process of making the walk to the cage, you know, like, do you remember what sort of emotions that, that elicited from you? Were you a guy that was scared walking to the cage? Yeah, I was, I, I'd cover it up behind a face of, um, you know, like a steely face, but I was shitting myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I always was. Every fight. I'd say it got worse as my career went on. It got, it got much, much worse because I started to put more pressure on myself. Yeah. You know, sometimes if you just detach the fucking pressure from yourself, yeah. it's, it's not as bad, right? But I think the more successful I got in my career in terms of what my job title was or the organization I was fighting for, the more pressure I put on myself. Yeah. And for me, that was kind of adverse. Um, when I was younger, having my first pro fight, for example, yeah, I was shitting myself nervous, but I wasn't like had this pressure on myself, like, oh, I've got to do well. I've trained for, you know, two fight camps in a row to get here. I've done, I've, you know, I've taken no shortcuts. No, I was still, you know, like drinking here and there and partying, having fun. You know, I thought I was top shit, um, but just as scared, right? Yeah, so I don't know. It got worse for me, and that was another reason why I kind of wanted to ultimately uh, quit because it was uncomfortable. 
Yeah, well, I think very that, uncomfortable. It, you know, as much as we try and uh, treat, you know, the fight as no different to any other day, right? Like, I think that's how, or well, that's definitely how how I approached fighting. You know, it was like I wanted to make sure that when I when I'm making the walk, it's just like it's it should be no different to any other day. But naturally, you know, the bigger the lights, the bigger the crowd. You know, that all plays a bit of an influence into it. I think there's different personalities, right? Like, so uh, for me, you know. I really try and detach from outcome, um, and it's probably not beneficial if you if you're a professional to detach from outcome because you know you you actually you know you need to have a positive outcome or you just no longer really have a career, right? Yeah, it's also a predicator of income <laughs> sometimes when you exactly yeah, yeah. yeah well when, when when especially when they're paying you know you're paying your shot fee and then it's a you know you double your income yeah. to win, right? Yeah. So so we're know, on the M5 here and there's just shit just flying everywhere, right? <laughs> But um, let's let's sort of wind it back for people. I do want to come back and talk more about the fighting stuff a, a yeah. bit later on. But so for you, where did you grow up? I grew up in the Northern Beaches. Um, my mum and dad were originally from Ireland. My dad came out in his teenage years. My mum came out in her twenties. Um, I grew up in uh, near Mona Vale, um, and then later on we moved to somewhere like Ingleside, which was just up the hill. My dad bought a small um, acreage, which used to be an old nursery. So for the most of the, my childhood, I grew up there, just kicking around. Um, you know, no pressure on me to do anything, certainly not homework. And uh, <laughs> yeah, just played around, shot shot the air rifle on the 22 and rode around a peewee motorbike and then later a, a bigger motorbike. So yeah, I just grew up in Sydney, Northern Beaches. And then did you have any, you got brothers, right? Two brothers, two older brothers, they kind of, I'd say that our older brothers, in in my instance, kind of cut the path for me in terms of, you know, they do all the hard work, they take all the risks, and you kind of observe and watch and know what you can and can't do when, right? Yeah. <laughs> and at a certain stage, your parents just get older and they just stop giving a fuck, right? <laughs> so actually, it was probably easier for me to come through on the back end of that after two brothers, right? They kind of terror, terrorized and terrorized around. I think I was a bit of an easier child yeah. um, at that point, right? And then your parents get more relaxed. So yeah, three of us. And then um, for you guys, you know, growing up, like as the as the youngest, do they did you ever get bullied or like by older brothers? Like no, no, no. They, 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 they never put it on you. No. I actually had um, good two brothers who were actually like quite protective of me. Yeah. Um, there's been several instances where, like, you know, for example, my my brother Ross, who's uh, the middle one in the family, like even if it was at school, if anyone left off to me. Actually, my first fight when I was kind of like 10 years old, there's a kid who was older than me who was giving me, who was trying to bully me or was bullying me essentially. My brother Ross, I think the kid was, you know, year five, I was year four, my, my brother was year six or something at the time. He, he said, no, let's go at lunchtime, you're going to go over and you're going to fight him. Well, Ross said to you. <laughs> yeah, he said to me. He, he's like, I'm bringing you over to fight this kid in a year above you. And then, yeah, he just watched. That was, that was kind of what he was like. And then, I mean, I've... Yeah, I've got a dozen other instances where we've been, um, you know, had to back each other up. And then, uh, you know, same goes for my older brother. <laughs> okay, and how did that first fight go? Like, who won? Oh, I ended up on top of the kid and the, the, the t- we ended up in the principal's office as per usual. Yeah. Um, and what did, the parent, what did your parents say to them? I don't know. I think, they're, I think they're a little bit like, you know, boys will be boys. Yeah, and, um, they're going to fight no matter what. Yeah, they're going to fight no matter what. You sort it out as long as you're not doing the wrong thing, right? Because, you know, <laughs> fighting's, to me, fighting's pretty natural. Um, and all those things are just like, you know, we can't express your emotions or you don't know what's going on. Like people fight uh, because it's an expression. So I think they get that. You know, and we were good kids. It was just we had our moments where we had a temper. We definitely got a temper in the in the line there somewhere. Um, and we like to fight. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, I, I find that interesting because, you know, we're in a society now that's relatively safe, so to speak, right? So violence is obviously, you know, fairly frowned upon, right? You do you do what you do when you're in the cage on the street and you end up in jail. Yeah. But, you know, you can do it in the cage and, and be celebrated for it, right? But, you know, I think about this even when it comes to, like, uh, like you know, when we think about, like, say, raising our own children, right? Like, if they turn around and say, hey, you know, I don't want to do any of what you're saying, ultimately it does end up almost violent. And I'm not saying, like, you know, bashing your kids, right? Yeah. But I'm saying it from the perspective of, like, if there's no consequences. No, you, you make it happen. Right? Yeah. So so it's like, you know, if, as an example, you, you try the timeout thing, 
But if you have a, a, a difficult child who doesn't even want to have a time out, like, what do you do? You still have yeah. to, you have to restrain them sometimes. If yeah, they, I've, so I've said, I've, myself and my wife have had to do it with our daughter for sure. Yeah, like if they if they if they're going off, then you know they they might be hitting hitting the parents as an example. But yeah. Like ultimately, you do have to use some form of physical contact to restrain your child. I believe so. Um, you know, again, I'm not saying like belt your child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah to be clear, that's not what yeah, we're saying. That's not what I'm saying. But you know, there's varying things that people do as parents, and I think you just got to do whatever works for you, right? Yeah, it's ultimately what people should be doing. But yeah, some people get fucking whack, and they get whack with how they do anything in life, training, everything. Um, yeah, I'll support something when someone can rationalize to me the reason why they do it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of diets, food, training, whatever it is, if they can back it up with some sort of science, with some sort of reading literature that they've done that isn't just hocus pocus, I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, I agree with you on the parenting thing. Yeah. So then, um, for you at school, like, what, what, what kind of kid were you, apart from the kid that, you know, had his brother <laughs> get him into fights? Um, pretty quiet. Um, I didn't want to ever stick out in a crowd. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, my, my biggest fear in, in the world is public speaking. Wow. And yeah, getting in front of a, a crowd of people um, was the most, uh, like, absolutely um, terrifying thing I could possibly do. Now, not so bad, right? Because yeah. I've got through that. But it's only, like, now as a mid-30s man that I could kind of get through that. What, what do you think changed for you to make you okay with public speaking? Well, no, nothing really changed because I still get, like, I still... Yeah, still don't like it and I dread it at all costs, whether it's speaking as a, at a wedding or speaking in front of, uh, you know, work, uh, work colleagues, not so much, but, you know, kind of any kind of public speaking. Um, and I think maybe the biggest expression of, uh, you know, getting out in front of people is fighting. So maybe there was an attraction to, well, I'm fucking scared to be in a crowd here and talk and do anything, but I, but I want to put myself in front of that crowd and fight. Because... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm sometimes when I need to have, um, you know, when I need to um, use my words to express myself, I find it very hard. So that's why fighting I found was like a, a physical expression of, uh, you know, your emotions, your feelings, and uh, something that you can, you know, fall in love with. And, when, and like just taking that to the next step, right? Like, so then for you, when you were fighting, was there like a, did you have to like fight angry or like would you channel those sorts of emotions when you're fighting? Um, no, I'd say that I'd have to fight not angry because even when I was growing up playing uh, basketball, rugby, I found that when I was in training, I would perform very well um, and I didn't really make that, make that kind of um, parallel, right, to fighting or to, to actually competing um, and not performing as well to putting more pressure on yourself, A, and B, trying to be more aggressive than you are. Yeah. So like, I think if you kind of, you want to practice how you want to fight. So yeah, I understand that some people are very, very relaxed in the gym and they need to step it up a gear because that comes with like, they need to step it up physically. They need to move faster. They need to, whatever it is. But for me, I was moving fine in the gym and then I, I'd get into the um, sparring or if it was rugby, I'd be good in training. I'd get into the game and I'd put emphasis on trying to be angry and then I'd make mistakes, Yeah. right? So for me, it would be about, yeah, if you could be angry, sure, and you want to hurt the person, great. But you still need to do that um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a form that's functional for what you're trying to achieve, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, otherwise, I just get too wild and loose and try to headhunt, which I was still doing, you know, because <laughs> I was scared more than I was. Um, so I wouldn't say that the, the anger part ever got in my way in fighting. It was more the, um, the being nervous and the, the kind of competition um, fear and nerves that would that would make you kind of like, you know, for example, feel like you're more gassed than you are. Yeah. Hyperventilate a little bit. Yeah. Uh, rush what you're doing and not look exactly like you do in training. And that's experience, I think. Yeah. So having, you know, less than 20 fights versus your average guy who's had 20 amateur, 20 pro, 40, yeah. 50 fights. I think you start to build into um, the fighter you should be around that 20 mark yeah. or 15 to 20 and I kind of just got there and I was done so yeah yeah and, and already fighting in competition is probably too hard for that level um, for myself um, subjectively right so some people are different I think they, they rise to the occasion and they they'll, they'll fight um, better than they should with less experience but for myself I think I would have liked more experience um, 
at a, at as you're coming up. Yeah, as I was coming up. Yeah, just just more experience. Yeah. yeah. So then, you know, as the as the quiet kid in school, like, did the teacher well, well, say that I was quiet, but I wasn't quiet with my mates. So I was always like making jokes and exactly how you would know me. Yeah. Um, but it was just more those those public situations where I didn't. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Um, why I've always been fearful of like public speaking and that kind of stuff and getting yeah. in front of a crowd. I've no idea. It's just literally something um, uh, physically that happens to me. I <laughs> stand up there and I uh, racing yeah. heart, nervous, you know, like dry, well, they, dry mouth. It's I, like stage fright. I think, I think, uh, I can't remember where I heard this, but it, it would have been on a podcast of some sort. And they were talking about how, yeah, a lot of people have that fear of public speaking. Yeah. And part of the reason is because historically, it's like it's one of those things the person that speaks out is usually the one that gets shot. <laughs> <laughs> right so no, don't shoot me yeah well it's like it's like the you know like the person who's you know able to speak out and and so you know the, a lot of people probably have this ingrained fear of public speaking yeah you know it's it's interesting for me because i don't have that fear of public speaking no, you I don't, Johnny. Of, yeah like i i from a young age like my parent i don't know whether it was my, my mom's what my mom did to me or whatever but <laughs> some, <laughs> something's happened in the sense yeah. that like i view um any time that the lights are on or any time like whether it's performing or competing, it's like that's your opportunity to put on a show. And whether that comes from some stupid reason, like, a, you know, whether I view that perhaps nothing, nothing, nothing's ever going to go wrong. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I definitely didn't have that belief that everything would go right when I was young. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something that I've more just developed as I've gotten older and, and sort of, you know, Whatever the outcome is, is whatever the outcome is. That, is right. that from a, a combination of your like achievements and the things you've got through in your life that have got you to that point, or do you think that's just maturity growing up? I think that is okay. So when it comes to that ability to reconcile whatever happens, happens. Yeah. That's that's probably more of a maturity thing. Yeah. Because you know, even when I was like, you know, by society standards, probably viewed as successful, I don't think I was still very mature. Yeah. Right. Like by the time, like when I first became, I guess, you know, having a, a good job title and successful in society's eyes. Yeah. I, I wasn't very mature. Um, but is successful in society's eyes just in, in like a introspection into what you think success in society is? Yeah. Well, see, I, I say this, I had this thing, right. Where like, okay, we can talk about this, right. Cause I think it's, sorry, that, that was a weird way to describe it, but sometimes yeah. like, what you deem as success is often what you think other people think you should be doing to be successful <laughs> rather than like, it's like sometimes I think, Oh, I should be financially fully stable now and making yeah. a lot of money. That's yeah. success. But really like when I ask myself what success is and that's what I know we've talked about it with family, like success is like being a, a good dad and a good partner and, and, uh, and being happy with who you are. Yes. Right. <laughs> and that's hard to get to. I'm not saying that's that's exactly well, what I am, but that's what, yeah. to me, success is. Yeah. So society's view of success is material things. Yeah. And the reason why it's material things is because, no matter what sort of experiences you have, I can't have those experiences on your behalf. So, you might have a life that is rich in experience, but you can't flaunt that. You can't really show that. No. Right? And all I can see is you and what you've got next to you and your. Yeah. Exactly. And so that's why you know. Um, so when I was growing up, like it was I, my, my view in terms of what was very important to me. So I, I, I term this like core values, right? Yeah. So I, I valued success very highly. And part of the reason for that is because um, when I, pretty much when I finished school, my, my parents had already like had a bit of a falling out. Um, my mum wasn't well and my brother was overseas. So I, bas I basically had to fend for myself. You know, I went and got an apprenticeship and I started working and so for me, it was always like, okay, you know, um, life at home isn't great, but I have these outlets that I can channel things into. And those things were, it was training, it was work. Right. And so they, they were where my real focuses were when I was like, you know, basically when I finished school, um, up until probably my late twenties. And so because they were my focuses, I got very good at both of those things. You know, what, so I, what did you want to do when you, um, when you, so what was your apprenticeship then? I did, I did mechanical, so I worked on Toyota cars, yeah. okay. servicing repairs yeah. for Toyota, Toyota vehicles, working at a Toyota dealership. Okay. And uh, I was studying at uni at the same time, so this, like, I would say this was the hardest part of my life, right? Because um, 
Studying a double degree so, at uni. Sorry, sorry. So you did a double degree doing an apprenticeship, apprenticeship at the same time. And training five nights a week. So, you Do know. People just think you're a maniac. Yeah, well, okay. It, 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 go, it goes even further than that, right? Like, because the double degree that I was doing is meant to be a five and a half year degree. Yeah. Law and psychology? No. Uh, law and engineering. Yeah, I thought you might have done psychology because you're always asking. No, no, my, or, or, you're always like, let me just uh, let me break this guy down. <laughs> <laughs> That's more from um, psychoanalyzing all, people. Yeah, doing all the podcasts, right? Uh, like, okay. Because I've, I've I've gotten to listen to so many people's life stories, I, I start to put things together. Now, yeah. there's no. Is there any similar, side? You, my, you find similarities in their story to their outcome yeah. of how they how they approach things. Yeah, approach things. Right. And so you know, like, is there any science behind it? Probably not. You know, um, bro science. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a bit of bro science, but it's. It's, you know, I guess the links that I sort of find and I ask people like, you know, I'll ask them, do you think that that was what it was? And sometimes that's an epiphany for them, right? But um, yeah, so like I, I finished the double degree in four and a half years. Yeah. And like part of my motivation for that was because, so my brother, he, he also did a double degree. He did uh, engineering and uh, arts, an arts degree, which was international studies. And I think he spent like, because towards the end of his degree, he was, he was working and just went to part-time and, and he finished his degree, I think, in like seven years. And I was like, there's no way I'm spending seven years at uni. Like after school, I was already like, that was enough. And then when I went to uni, I was like, I don't want to spend four and a half years at uni. So, so how long did you do that degree in? Four and a half. I finished a year early. So you're yeah. doing sometimes, Extra subjects. sometimes five subjects. Yeah. Stuff. Um, and so like, so he, here's a little, here's a little learning that I found from that, right? Because everyone will tell you you can't do it, right? So as an example, you go to enroll at uni and then you say, yeah, I'm going to do five subjects. They say, you can't do that. And I say, why? And they say, oh, because... Workload. Yeah, the workload's too much, right? And so all I did was I just didn't, I didn't, I just enrolled in the subject and just didn't talk about it. So I was doing five subjects when I started. I did that for the first uh, year or two years or whatever. Then when I started working my apprenticeship... Four and three, yeah. Um, when I started working my apprenticeship, I said to I said to the boss at the time, "I'll, I'll, um, we'll go to the next one, go to the Packers." Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I said to I said to him, you know, like, oh, if I have to cut my uni down to part time, I will, right? And so what I, what I did was then all I did for that year, first year when I was working, I dropped a subject. I went to four subjects as opposed to doing five. Still yeah. doing full time work. Which is normal, yeah. And actually, actually did worse. Because I failed two subjects, one in each semester, uh, because I was probably too relaxed about it. Like there was no pressure. Yeah. Right. And so then I was like, "Fuck!" Now I'm behind. Like I just, you know, the, the work that I did last year, I just I'm back onto like little playing field. So give me your, give me a rundown of your day. So if you're like working an apprentice, how would you get fit in your? You're at UTS or something. Yeah, I was at UTS. <laughs> so credit to UTS. UTS is like really flexible. Um, so a majority of my subjects, were, I would do night classes. And then whatever I couldn't, then it was like uh, having good friends who could take lecture notes for me. So my attendance was like rubbish. Like, let's, let's just be real, right? 50%. <laughs> um, Less. Uh, I go get yeah. a degree. <clears throat> that's, the, uh, that's the old P's to get degrees, right? Yeah, but that's, that's pretty tough though. Like, you, you still need to be... Um, for anybody listening, you still need to be, um, you know, intelligent, right? Because you, you, not everyone can do that. Well, that's, this is the adage of, you know, you got to work smarter, not harder, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I was working hard, like just simply because of workload. So, so I guess in terms of how that looked from a work week, it was like, you know, uni, whatever days I had uni. So every night I would either have uni. Sometimes I'll skip out on uni so I could go training instead. Um, working, you know, throughout work hours, whenever I didn't have uni at TAFE one day a week. So, um, one of the benefits was, of, was TAFE just like a walk in the park compared to what you were doing at um, uni? No, it's a totally different skill set. You know, I always talk about this because I think, you know, the skill set that you learn in TAFE is actually, I actually found it more to my style of learning. Like, I guess I'm a learner that likes to, to do things. Yeah. Whereas the lecture style of learning that you get in university, like, like I, I passed, but it just, it, it wasn't, I don't think that's the, the, the fastest way for me to learn. So a lot of the times, yeah, I would actually skip the lectures and just go through the material myself or with friends or whatever. Um, and so at TAFE, uh, when I was doing the technician or the certificate for um, light vehicle mechanics or whatever, there's two options. You could go to one TAFE at Blacktown, which was like classroom environment, 
But then I went to, I, I then switched out of that and went to Hornsby because it was self paced. So you meant to go to TAFE for three years. Here's another story. Did it in two. <laughs> like it was just one of those things, right? Like, yeah. so I was in a rush, like, and, and for what purpose? I can't tell you, but I was in this rush in my life that, you know, I need to finish things quick and I need to finish things early because at the end of the day, I'm trying to support myself. Yes, I was still living at home, but nobody was there. Like my dad was at, at his workplace. And my mum was like overseas. Yeah. Um, and she had her mental health problems, etc. So for me, it was always like, I, I need to be able to look after my family. I want to be, you know, try and make the big bucks so that I can... Um, How know, much of an emphasis did you put on making the big bucks? Like, was it driven financially? Was it driven to, for you to accomplish stuff? Was it things you've always wanted to do? Like, it was a combination of that financial. financial. Yeah, that was like, the biggest driver? Yeah, well, like, you know, um, my mum wasn't, like, she wasn't capable of working mentally, right? So, yeah. and then... Did you think if I do my law degree, um, I can be a lawyer, I'm a good talker, I can, I can represent, I can be quite successful, <laughs> I can litigate? Is that, is that where your mind went? No, there was a, there's a story behind that too. Originally, like, so yeah, originally I was thinking before, I, um, when I was going to go to uni, I was like, I was just going to do engineering. And then I got the marks, so I was like, I'll just do law as well. What are my two best subjects at school? It was English and maths. What are the two things that are probably most like English and maths? Engineering and, and law. Yeah, so, so that was like my dumb rationale for, for doing that. And then why I ended up going into the automotive industry is like, I was thinking, you know, what industries can I actually apply these two degrees in? Because I didn't, like, what's the point of studying these two degrees if I can't blend them somehow, right? And then there was only really two, two, two areas you could go. It was either you're going to go into civil and construction, Yep. And to be like a conveyancer or something, or automotive. And I loved Toyota cars at the time, and so it was like, okay, I'll see if I can get a job in automotive. And that's that's that was my logic and how I ended up starting there. But partway through that, so when I was still at uni, um, this opportunity came up to to work at a really really good law firm. And it was a it was only it was like a temporary role, but like a, on a contract, right? Yeah. But, um, the opportunity was then, you know, potentially if you performed well, they might give you a, a job. And I was like, okay, this, you know, at what, so what I did was I was like, I was thinking in my head, okay, I'm going to... You can't not go to this one. <laughs> I'm going to use my annual leave and I'll go work that and see how it goes. And then if it, if it works out, then I'll, I'll quit the apprenticeship. That was what I was thinking. But I had a really good boss at, <laughs> at the dealership. And... He was, a, he was a bit of a, he was a mentor, like, you know, and he said to me, I remember having one of my first meetings with him, like, and he would say to me, you know, like he had this opportunity to go and pursue golf professionally yeah. or choose to be in the automotive game and, and, and do his apprenticeship and run and like, get, you know, progress his automotive career. And at the time he, he chose the automotive career and where that got him was, you know, he's now the owner of this business and he's, he owns a lot more businesses now and he's very, very financially wealthy uh, and successful. And so I was like, okay, you know, um, that, that played in my mind and that's also part of the reason why I didn't pursue fighting as a career. I, I would have thought the opposite. I thought the guy was going to say, I regret not pursuing the golf, but he's like, I've made money. It's, but you, but, you know, look, it's pretty hard to, to say I regret you, not you, pursuing you, golf when he turns around and says to me, you know, now I own these businesses. I make, let's say for arbitrary sake, $10 million a year. And I can play golf whenever I want. Yeah, but the inverse is also <laughs> I um I can make money in jobs whenever I want. Yeah, because I am whatever. But you you got a finite window to play professional sports. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I know what you mean as a hobbyist, right? So obviously he didn't regret it. He didn't regret it. Yeah, but look, look, I think anyone that doesn't pursue a sport, you know, professionally and and they have the passion to do so, would ultimately regret it. But I think for him, you know. He probably realized that the pathway to that was, uh, he, went, he, he probably wasn't prepared to make those sacrifices. Yeah. But from a working wise and from a business career, Made sense. he was prepared to make those sacrifices. So that was me. You know, I was prepared to make those sacrifices to try and be successful from the business side of things. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I ended up going so heavily down that pathway, right? So when this opportunity came up, I originally said to the recruiter, yeah, I'll do it. Sat on it for probably a week. Before I was about to go and start, then I called her back and I said, hey, I can't do this. And she's like, do you realize like what you're doing to me right now? Like I've already told them that you're going to start and now you're saying that you're not going to. Like you're not going to, you'll never get a job there again. And I was like, I do realize that. 
but I, I, I realized that I, I can't do this, you know, and so that's what made me then go head first down the, the automotive path. Yeah, you said if I if I pull the pin on that now, I'm going to fully commit to what I'm doing here. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes you have to close that door before you can move to the next thing, right? And so yeah, for me, like law was never never the goal, right? Like same thing for you, right? Like you you went and did uh, construction, right? Did construction. I, I finished my undergraduate. I wanted to stay in university longer, so I started a Juris Doctor at um, UTS. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Just like tell everybody that I just want to keep training for a while, right? That's what happened. So it's to buy yourself time. Buy, buy myself time. Actually, I, I did like the idea of um, of studying law. Maybe it was like the romantic notion of doing it as well. I studied a few subjects in construction with law, like torts, restitution, contracts. Yeah. And I was like, I like it. Um, but again, it just it wasn't, I wasn't being true to myself, perhaps. Um, yeah, and, and I wasn't committed enough. I think if you want to do something, like if I wanted to do it, of course, I think I can actually complete it you got to want to do it yeah you got to want to do it you got to want to spend the time and if you don't want to put the hours in and spend the time it's like it's what's the point a waste of time yeah unless you're just doing it to make someone feel happy or some people maybe just do shit like that to make themselves feel happy even knowing that it's never really going to get them anyway yeah so then okay let's let's just go back one step so what was high school like for you uh i was i'd say that i never really um applied myself 100% <laughs> um, I was always like a moderate student. I had, I had some. Uh, I'll talk about academically first. I was always a moderate student. Um, was average in a lot of subjects. Right. Um, I had some peaks in year ten, and when I I got I uh, started studying in year ten, and then did quite well academically. And then in year eleven and twelve, my final years, when everybody else started studying for the HSC, I just continued to track the same. Yeah. So yeah, I went. I was just just got got by doing what I needed to do to get the marks I needed to get to university was basically it. And then I never really found like, you know, school was for me and the format of it. I was always just like a little bit perplexed as to like, I don't know, why I was doing like in school like it was. It just I don't know, it just didn't seem like a natural fit for me. Um, and then in sporting sense I was small and underdeveloped in the younger years. Subsequently, played in a lot of the lower teams uh, till I was like 16, and I kind of same size as I am now. And then it, I kind of caught up to everybody else. But mentally, I still think I was used to being small for my year and younger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, by by the senior years, I was in like you know kind of top sports teams in my year type thing. Um, but yeah, I, I never would put myself in the category as just mentally thinking that I was always there. I was always the younger brother, always smaller for my year, average academically, didn't like public speaking. Uh, like, you know, very comfortable around friends, but not around um, other people. I think a lot of those skills that I have, like social skills, were just like observation and learnt to, uh, to get by. Yeah. And then they just turned into like tools. They're tools, right? So then, like, what, why did you choose to go into construction? <laughs> <laughs> as simple as my eldest brother Mark he studied construction and uh, I thought that's the only thing on that um, that list of university courses that sounds like it interests me I think I should go to university sweet I'll, I'll put my name down for that that was literally the methodology that went into um, picking a course Yeah, it was, there was no thought that's why when, when people ask me like Oh, what should I do when I finish school? Oh, I'm like, well, I, I honestly think if you don't know, you should just get a fucking job. Think about what you don't want to do first, and then think about what you do want to do. Because yeah. sometimes, like, you just need some experience in the in the real world, right? Um, which, yeah, I didn't give myself a chance to. I just went straight out of school to university, got two years in, was already fighting, decided that yeah, I'm probably never going to do this. Uh, construction or this degree in, in, in a work sense, but I've got two years through and I don't like quitting stuff, so yeah. I'm just going to finish. Um, but it, it, anyway, like long story, turns turns out I wouldn't have ever worked for the UFC had I not had a university undergraduate degree. So, really, you know, because some Is countries, that a requirement? it's a requirement for the visa in China. Like, so it's so like yeah. it's like some things you do in life. I guess may seem frivolous, you know, <laughs> to not maybe not a degree, but. Um, 
but in the end, like, yeah, it actually paid for itself. Yeah. Because <laughs> it got me, um, got me time to train four years, you know, where no one was asking questions because I was at uni. Yeah. <laughs> fucking seven hours of lectures a week or something or whatever <laughs> it was for, 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 um, four subjects. I was just training two, three days a week. And yeah, and it ended up ultimately allowing me to get the visa to end up working for the UFC. So it's like, yeah, seemed like a big fat waste of time. Maybe I should have done something else, but yeah. Well, I, th- I, I think, think, I think the only other thing that I, I, I really wanted to do, it wouldn't get the marks was a veterinary. Yeah. Um, and I just never quite believed that I could um, stick out the time duration of it. Like yeah. I thought, oh, this is just such a mammoth task. I even looked at going back uh, later when I was fighting and my dad's like, fuck it, do it. I'll pay for it uh, at Charles Sturt University. I'm just like, oh, fuck, it's just, I think even at the time I was 25 then, I was like, oh, it's just too much of a commitment. Five years, I'll be 30, I'll be fucking dead. <laughs> now I'm 34 going, oh, maybe I, maybe I, maybe I should have. <laughs> um, no, I don't think like that, but that's how I thought at the time. So I think for people who are younger, you think something's such a long period of time because you kind of truncate things into uni, school, whatever it is, marsh, um, you know, your work. But it's like five years in the scheme of it's nothing. Yeah. And um, I wish I didn't think like that when I was younger. Just apply yourself to the task and don't worry about the time. Yeah. Well, the time thing is an interesting one because it's like, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're 18 or whatever and you've been at school for 12, 13 years of your life, like, yeah, it's 13 years out of your 18 years. It's a big proportion of your life. But when you're 26, well, it's only half your life. And then when you're 39, it's a third of your life. And that's, that's totally right now. With, with the school thing, I feel the same now. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's just a small portion of my life. But I think when you finish school, you're in such developmental years from kind of 18 to whenever, finishing university or getting your first job, that you, you don't want to commit yourself to a time like school, you're like, I just got out of school for my whole life yeah. thus far yeah. that I can remember. Yeah. I don't want to commit to like it's something totally again. crazy. Um, you yeah. know, some people know that, you know, some people, some, kind of, some people kind of know what they want to do. Like I was literally just talking to uh, a family friend yesterday who walked past my house and her son was the same age as me. We grew up together. We were never, my, my mum and dad were family friends. So we just knew each other growing up, went to separate schools. He's a... Uh, um, Neurologist, right? Neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon. So for the brain. Neurosurgeon for the brain. Um, you know, we were chatting about the commitment that, that 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 is in your life, and she was like, "No, no, I've got two other family members who are surgeons." Like we we were telling him, say the opposite to a lot of parents. They're like, we were telling them that like this is a life commitment. Doing this, not just the study, like the actual lifestyle that you're gonna live is just a massive commitment. Like they were almost like. We were kind of like warning him like not, not to do it, but without telling him not to do it. Yeah. Um, now he's, you know, a, a neurosurgeon working in, you know, one of the hospitals in Sydney and he's got a young child as well. And I said, you know, how, how much time does he get with the child a week? And she's like, sometimes he doesn't see the child for four days straight because he's working 20 hour shifts or he's at the hospital for 20 hours. He's on call. Um, he's the same age as me, 34. Wow. Like, that's a hectic job. You study for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Yeah. Um, and then your just lifestyle is absolutely smashed through work. Yeah. Um, and I don't even think you get compensated that well till another ten years after. Well, so like that's a that's a commitment. It's, it's more of a commitment than UFC fighting black belts, like in car dealing. It's like that's a big commitment. I don't know a, if I could do that. No, well, that's a that's a commitment that permeates your entire lifestyle. I like uh, one of my one of my doctor mates. He was saying, you know, part of the reason, you know, a lot of doctors come out of the system, they're, they're already jaded because they spent so long in the schooling system that it's like, I need to make bank. Like, everybody else has been working for the last seven, eight years while I've still been in school. So, you know, that's part of the reason why they, they, they chase, you know, they get so well, remunerated so highly is because it's like, you know, to go through that process is, right. a, is a long and grueling process. 100%. And they probably have a good union who's just like... You better pay us. You better <laughs> pay us. So, okay, I, I'm a little bit curious about, you know, what your parents thought of the whole fighting thing. Oh, I don't think they ever really, like, um, got behind it 100%. Um, but nor did they tell me not to do it once I was doing it. Um, so, yeah, I don't think they really got behind it. I'm pretty sure, like, not to my face, but, like, they would always be, like, telling people, oh, Richie, we wish you would quit fighting and just get a job. But I'm, like, thinking, like, 
now I'm like, that's the worst advice I would give my kids. Like, yeah. quit what you're doing that you really like to just get a job. You can yeah. fucking get a job anytime you want. Yeah, that's right. To be honest, if it's just a job. Yeah. yeah but if you're doing something that you like and you're getting compensated for, you know, albeit you're not getting too hurt and yeah. fighting, you know, I, I would I would support my children to do whatever they wanted. Yeah. Um, because you have to degree and then because ultimately, you know. if you if you're driven and you're passionate about something, you're going to do it whether you get someone's permission or not. Yeah. So if if you've raised your children correctly, and they want to make that decision to commit to something wholeheartedly, you just got to support them. Yeah. Um, and that's just I think something that I've learned because I've been there and done that, and I know what it feels like when you know you're worried about what other people think of you, which is pretty normal, and I do worry about that a lot. It's like what other people think of you, how you should raise your kids, how you should do this, how you do that. You're taking inputs from everywhere, but um, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter. You just got to do what you want to do yeah. in agreement with your wife most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> or just go rogue. But yeah, I mean, that's what you come to, the conclusion I think you come to in your 30s, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're like, you know, your, your high school and primary school days or whatever, you've been told what to do, your 20s, you're you think you know what you want to do and you should just do whatever you want, you want to do yourself, but you, you don't know and you're still, you know, um, feeling that judgment from other people of what you should and shouldn't do. And then your 30s, you're like, okay, now I've got to assess with with what I've learned through life experience and, and um, with people I know, like, what actually makes me happy and what, what I want to do, right? Or what I need to do to stay uh, focused and stay from being totally insane, right? Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at, where I'm at. I know you're in your thirties, but um, some of the some of the more challenging years of your life, perhaps. Yeah, it's just I think um, you realize when you when you get older is like everything is priorities, right? Yeah. And the problem is, is that there are, there are priorities that you can't shirk. Well, if you want to be a good dad, you can't shirk them. If you want to be a deadbeat dad, you could. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. so you know, like your list sort of gets longer, and then it's like. Like the saying, you know, is, uh, having a lack of time is not a really a lack of time. It's a lack of priorities. Yeah. You know, unfortunately for a guy like me, it's like I've, I've got so many priorities, right? And so it's about shuffling all those priorities around all the time, consistently shuffling them to try and fit in the things that are, uh, I guess, the most important and not just prioritizing the most urgent, right? Like when we go around chasing things that are urgent, like we've, we've probably let our lives get to a state and that's why we're only doing focusing on things that are urgent, yeah. right? Whereas if we do the things that are important, hopefully we don't have as many of those urgent things because we're getting them out of the way as part of like our daily housekeeping or our monthly housekeeping to just get those things sorted. Yeah. But it also so, changes. So how, how do you diarize that? Like how do you schedule your day, your week, your oh. month so that you don't um, you know, have these kind of urgent things that come up So that adversely affect everybody, right? Well, okay. So I, I think... You know, from a, like, so if we talk about, like, from a household perspective, right, I'm, I'm a big believer that we need to, like, there, there needs to be, a de like, a delineation of responsibility, right? Like, I, I need to be able to trust my wife that she's going to handle certain tasks, and on the flip side, I handle certain tasks, right? And people might say that, you know, it's potentially sexist or whatever, but, like, my wife's an accountant, Right? She should be in charge of our finances, right? Don't give it to the, the business guy who's just going to go and, like, go and invest it in some bullshit or, yeah. like, go and spend it on something, right? Give it to the accountant who actually knows what to do with money. So in my household, that's how it works, right? Like, I, I, yeah. you know, sometimes uh, Andrew get a little bit shitty at me and she's like, you know, you know, you can pay these bills too. And I'm like, you know what will happen? If you want me to pay these bills, we're going to double pay all of these bills because I'll pay them and then you'll go... Johnny's forgotten, and then you end up paying them. So I'd rather just be able to say, you handle that, and I'll worry about, so I'll worry about the income generation, you worry about the, the accounts and all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. So I think, I think that sort of is, is really important. Right? And obviously, a lot of things change, right? Like I think, so, you know, I'll, at the moment, you know, I, I try and do all the kids' lunches for school, and I'll, I'll do that part of it, right? But, you know, I think... Um, Every household just needs to have that open communication to go and work out, okay, who's trying to work on what? Like, well, who's, whose responsibility is what? Because ideally, you know, um, if one of us doesn't have to work, that, that's ideal. So when, uh, when, Ange, when, I stopped, when I wasn't working, Ange went back to work. Yeah. And that was nice for her to have that bit of a break. And, and so then I was the stay-at-home dad, right? But now I'm back to work, so she's now 
back at home. Yeah. Right. So I think it's just it's nice to be able to have that delineation of responsibility, um, because yeah, like the reality is that it's so hard to fit in everything that you want to do. Like, if you really wanted to do everything that you wanted to do, like something's got to give, or either that, or you're just going to do nothing well. And I think you know we've both got those personalities where if we're going to do something, we want to do it well. So so that means then just cutting out a lot of the stuff that isn't as important. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I feel that, and I do feel it because um, Dara and my wife works full time as well. Trying to strike that balance is increasingly hard when yeah. you when you're both working full time. Yeah, with two young children, maybe that's just a, a a product of where we are in our lives right now with young children or whatever else. But we're not the first people to do it. <laughs> yeah, as I've been reminded by other people. Well, I think I think that goes into a, a bigger society, a societal issue, right? And <laughs> where are we going? We're going to the moon. <laughs> well, I might as well talk about this. I always talk about this because I think, it, isn't it? I, I just find it interesting. And look, you know, the feminists will probably come after me for this, right? But it's just, you know, um, we, we try and put these unrealistic expectations on women that they have to be able to do it all. Yep. Right? They've got to be able to work. They've got to be able to do the family. And, you know, it's like when you look at it from a, a government perspective, like, what do we incentivize? We incentivize, we put out, you get a childcare subsidy for throwing your child into childcare. We don't want you to raise your own kids. We want you to throw them, in, throw them into childcare so that you can work and pay your taxes. And then all we're doing is we're giving those, those taxes that we've taken from you, we give them back to you in the form of these subsidies that you can only use for the things that we want you to use them for. Right? So I just think that that's a, it's a real issue because it's like, especially in Sydney, right? Like, it's pretty hard to survive on a single income nowadays. Right, hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. So, so we, so then we're forcing. Like, I think if, and, and that's why I'm saying it's like it should be a choice for females if they if they want to go back into the workforce. That's completely up to them. Like, if Angie wants to go back to work, I'm going to support her hundred percent. But if she wants to spend time with the kids and be at home, I want to be able to support her to do that too. And so I just think you know, like, the fact that we only incentivize certain behaviors, right? We we normalize the fact that it, hey, don't raise your own child. Let's put him in childcare so you can go back to work. Yeah. Right, like we're sort of, and if you if you don't want to put your, your child into childcare, you get nothing. If yeah. you want to be a stay at home mum, yeah, Ch- childcare is is um, yeah, it's it's kind of weird, a, a weird concept. I get it in the fact that say you know Anne wanted to go back to work to keep current in her accounting skills because she knows when the children are older she'd like to work, so therefore working one to two days a week keeps her um, in the game, so yeah. to speak. It's like I don't train martial arts at the moment much maybe I train once a week if I train two three times a week I stay really you know contemporary to what's happening if I train a couple of times a week I just I can stay fit and I can stay ready to to train right yes yeah. it's the same like that with work I imagine you lose your confidence when you're out of an industry that's uh, quite skilled like accounting right so yeah. I understand that people want to continue to work and they want a career if they are female um, same with males right but yeah I don't understand the pressure for for people to work full time and have your kids in daycare the whole time because you know, even myself and my wife are like, this just doesn't seem right. So yeah. We've got them in there four days a week and it's like three days a week. I'm thinking like, that's, I can deal with that. I can actually deal with that because I've seen the daycare. I know how they operate. I feel very comfortable that the kids are getting um, socialized and they're learning, they're learning skills, right? Yeah. They're getting input from different people. Yeah. It's, it's helping them grow into, into um, individuals. Um, I, I guess... Because my theory is um, that's kind of like it, to be at home also by ourselves the whole time with the kids is not normal either. It's usually, you know, there's would have been grandparents, you know, one to 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and we haven't evolved since then. There would have been a tribe of people around. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so they are getting those social interactions. They are speaking to people who are relations or non relations who live within a community because people rely on communities. So, I can understand the benefits, but yeah, I, I'm pretty acutely aware of the financial <laughs> <laughs> implications. Yeah, implications, <laughs> and and also you just want to raise your kids, you know. Yeah. You don't you don't you don't um, have them to fucking let someone else raise them. You know? Yeah, that's, that's right. the point. You want to have a big input into into their lives. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I just yeah, like that's 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 a real bugbear of mine because it's like you know. Um, Soon we're on a political r- political rampage. We're, we're on the way to Canberra. To, 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 <laughs> to, go, yeah. no, we're going straight to Parliament. Parliament. <laughs> yeah. On fire. No, yeah, it's just one of those things. I just feel like it's just it's it's silly. Right? Like it's just the way that it's this, 
they said it. Like, I can see how, um, why people could read into a conspiracy behind the scenes there. It's that, that, you know, that that's why we do those things so that we can tax, you know, but like tax 100% of the population. Because yeah. 50% of the population is not paying taxes. Well, that's money that the government's not getting. The government yeah. needs to fund all its things that it's doing or whatever. Yeah. So, all, 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 the, all the money that they're squandering away or wasting. I think the government also makes most of the money off, you know, the middle income earners, you know, the, the, the middle class type people, like, they get taxed very heavily. They don't have companies that probably work for people and they pay 40% of their money income tax, goes yeah. straight to the government, yeah. you know. And that might be, yeah, might be double the wage of a low income earner, but they only get half of it. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's go back to the fighting stuff, right? So, because when you, well, I guess, or well, before we go back into fighting, but um, any any interesting stories out of doing the construction degree, like, <laughs> not really. Like uh, in terms of the degree was really just to buy me four years of training full time when nobody asked me any questions, right? Yeah. I could live at home. <laughs> so I mean, it, it's it served its purpose pretty well. Um, at the time, I was training with uh, the guys at VT1 Gym. You know, so, so what was your first foray into martial arts? Like, when did you start? What, what age? Uh, only when I was finishing school, to be honest. Um, I'd started doing, like, a little bit of, like, hitting pads and bringing the boxing gloves when I was at school. Yeah. Because my eldest brother, Mark, had done a bit of boxing at PCYC. So, I mean, I guess, call it that, I was always into the boxing idea and thought I could box better than I could. Yeah. Perhaps. It's the Irish in you. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. So, but, but my real... Um, yeah. My real um, introduction was kind of Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu with the Reznikovs, okay. Liam and Dylan Reznikov, uh, in 2006. I think it was, or five. That's really when I started. So it was only really like kind of five to six years after that. It was in the UFC, five years, but we were training. Um, and prior to that, like I did commit a lot of my time when I was a teenager to, to lifting weights and trying to be good at rugby you know until i was 17 and then i went ah uh, i'm athletic but i'm never going to be that good at rugby so i'm going to find something else that i really think i could be good at that's probably like a weight based sport because yeah. i knew i was 76 kilos in year 12 at school at 17 very very strong for my weight pretty fast pretty fit long distance short distance i was like a good athlete all round yeah so i was like um okay i'm a good athlete all round but i'm not quite super um, you know, big enough to play rugby, what can, what can I do? And at the time I was watching the UFC and I was fascinated by it. I always liked fighting. I like I liked the aggressive, the, the kind of competitive side, competitive side of sport that I wasn't allowed to be just in normal society walking around, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think I'm just going to move here. Um, like when I played basketball, I used to like, I used to get, I was saying, I used to always get fouled out because I'd be like tech, not tech fouled out, but I'd be, yeah, five and out. I'd be like, I'd get, I'd get real physical, get in people's faces, grab their jerseys, piss them off. And I used to love that. Like I used to love like just playing the game and getting on people's nerves, right? And I think that's because sport was an expression of where I could do that. I could, um, I could kind of utilize some aggression and, and make a game of it, right? Yeah. And fuck with people a bit. And that's where I, um, kind of really liked the idea of the, the UFC when I saw it because I was like, yeah, I definitely want to fight. I'm going to do that. I just remember watching it going, and perhaps that's why I quit when I did because my goal was never to be the champion. Like I said before, it was to get in the UFC and be there. And I think when I first watched it, I went, I'm going to do that. Like, I am 100% going to do that. And do you I, remember what fight that was that you were watching? I think I was watching um, like this, that we, we used to have this like shared network at school and someone had uploaded just the UFC like um, greatest knockouts volume one two yeah whatever it was so I was watching that so it was at the time I was watching I was still watching like um, the Gracies like Hoist Gracie do the front kick and the takedown and uh, Tank Abbott um, those kind of fights yeah. so, like they're the fights I was watching just going this is sick I'm gonna <laughs> do this so, from that point on I was watching I think it was, we were watching UFC 60 at the time yeah like, it was like then I started watching like almost every UFC to pretty much every UFC to UFC 200, um, around 200, circa 200, right? Yeah. And then since, you know, I stopped fighting, I've been a little bit, le you know, um, in and out of it, depending on if I know someone who's fighting. When I was working for the UFC, if I was 
coaching someone who's fighting on the card, obviously, or when I was working with them, I just watch it to stay current, you know, because it it, it became work then. Yeah. It, it become when I was um in the UFC, it was like I'm watching it as a fan slash seeing who's in the UFC, people I know, you know, fight planning, game planning. Then once I was working for the UFC, it's funny. It's like I was watching this UFC on the weekend, but I'm like I'm watching fights all week, game planning for fights all week, and now I'm watching the UFC. It's like I still enjoy it. <laughs> I still enjoy it, and and I guess you come you come to the point where you have children. It's like you can't watch a whole Sunday from yeah. from you know seven a.m. to yeah. to two o'clock to watch the UFC. I will end up doing that when I get a big TV and the kids are a bit older. Yeah, but for now, it's it's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back. All righty, we're back on. Slight, slight wardrobe, slight wardrobe change. <laughs> yeah, slight wardrobe change while she's got the sunnies on. But anyway, so we we're talking about um, you. Yeah, you you only started martial arts basically when you finished school. Correct. Yeah. Right. Uh, Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu at the same time. BJJ, Muay yep. Thai. Um, at least for the first couple of years um, before I and I just learned wrestling from from Liam as well, who was you know, primarily my Jiu Jitsu coach and MMA coach, right? Yeah. Um, he he'd had a background in karate, some judo, um, and Jiu Jitsu. I think at the time he was. Purple belt just got his brown belt. Yeah. So this is a this is a long time ago now because he's been a black belt for many many years. But um, yeah, so that's that's how I started. Primarily Muay Thai for the striking with Dylan, um, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for the groundwork. And, and as we went on further, you know, saying from zero to five years, we imp- implemented some wrestling coaches would come in and out, um, and then you know we'd upskill ourselves as um, the owners of the gym and myself. So like yeah, it was kind of like a bit of a journey, I guess, through. You know, but always with that kind of outset of wanting to get better at mixed martial arts. So we, we already had an understanding coming in um, of what the outcome was, which was to improve MMA. And then to do that, I knew that you had to combine the martial arts. And then Liam knew that, uh, who's my coach, he, he kind of understood that you could you could take what you wanted from each of them that was applicable in the sport, right? Yep. So And create drills around that, situational stuff. So I feel like we were ahead of, we were ahead of the curve in Australia quite quite a lot. Um, not to say there wasn't other guys doing that in Australia, but there was only a handful, like literally. Well, Liam, um, Liam and Dylan were like guys that would they would go overseas for months at a time, you know, seeking out whether it was Danaha or going to Thailand and, and training. And Yeah, I think Liam just invested a lot of money um, doing privates with high-end coaches worldwide and also spent a lot of money, like... Um, going to gyms and learning about their business procedures and how they yeah. operate. Yeah. Um, whether it was Lloyd Irvin, you know, Gracie's, whoever it was, he invested a lot of money. And um, you know, people can say what they want, but I think you've got to understand the business you're getting into. And um, I learned a lot from just observation of his gym. I remember it was one of the first um, memories of mine from even when we're in a scout hall, you know, VT1, the gym where I'm from was in a scout hall. We used to set up the jigsaw mats and we'd train. Even back then, when I first started, I think I was 17, um, Liam was like, hey, hey, you know, put your shirt back on. Don't take your shirt off. You know, no, no shirts off. People, girls and guys don't want to come in when they're, you know, they're fearful of walking into a gym in the first place and see, A, you, with your shirt off and a six-pack. B, Marcus and you, and next fucking, to me. And you fucked up ears. Well, not yet. And then, <laughs> and then Marcus next to me with tattoos. He's like, they don't want to see that. You know, girls don't want to see it. Guys who are not confident in training, who want to step in the mat, they don't want to see it. But when they come in, you know, have, look look presentable, look neat, shake their hand, bring them into the gym. Like, so he already understood the the fundamentals of, I think, bringing people into the gym and the business side of it, which yeah. um, we I just kind of come up through the, the ranks just understanding that right from the get-go, right? So walking into other gyms and seeing such a shit show, back then especially, was always really um, fascinating for me. Well, it's an opportunity to... To set yourself apart, right? Set a higher standard, and that's part of the uh, the value proposition, right? Yeah. Where if if people were, you know, so uh, to shop around and go to a few different gyms, you know, they're more likely to pick the one that looks tidy, you know, has the friendly people, you know, is true. Because right? because at the end of the day, like the vast majority of people, you don't know when you walk into a gym how good this guy is going to be at coaching me to a high level or taking me. Uh, or whatever, or most people don't even want to get to a high level. They just want to start a martial art. They just want to feel empowered. They want to get fit, whatever it is. They don't actually really care about how well credentialed the coach is in a competition setting. They often just think cleanliness, facilities, 
close to where I'm traveling to and from, public transport, parking. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty simple, right? And um, I was kind of acutely aware of those things very early, just from observation of watching um, my coaches set up a gym. Um, and I'm sure not all those things were pre-taught out, but a um, combination of good luck and probably um, research. Uh, I got them in that situation where they come to tick all those boxes, right? And then the, the, the gym, as I started from kind of 20 odd members, grew up to, you know, almost a thousand at one point, I think. Yeah. So, um, you know, the emphasis on fighters and myself was always pretty, pretty low because, you know, we make up a small percentage of any gym cohort yeah. and we don't bring in the, we don't bring in a lot of the money, right? No. So the, the fight team was always, um, aside to the commercial, Reality the, commercials, the commercials of a gym, right? <laughs> so you make your money off the 99.5% of people who, um, who are, you know, just rocking up nightly and, and paying the bills. And then you can focus a little bit of energy on, you know, your fight team as a labor of love, I yeah. would say. And that's kind of what we always had. We had a small fight team. We worked together, started off with uh, Muay Thai Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, worked its way into, uh, you know, learning wrestling, folk style, adding coaches in as I went upskilling, getting a boxing coach, trying to combine it together. Um, so, yeah, and, and, I, and I drove that myself as well as, as well as my coach. Yeah. So then, because uh, you did, uh, you would have done like some jits comps and some kickboxing comps before yeah, you yeah. went into MMA, right? Yeah, I did like multiple like amateur kind of comps, sparring days, all that kind of stuff. But MMA itself didn't really have amateur back then. It was only professional. There was no amateur actually. Yeah, and uh, the amateur and so, boxing and, 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 yeah. and uh, kickboxing and uh, you know, in-house competitions were kind of amateur um, sparring days. But MMA was MMA. <laughs> there yeah. was, and, and one thing that I can't reconcile right now is I go to an amateur MMA show or whatever, the B-class, C-class rules, I'm like, why the fuck would you fight? Like, I'm saying this because we're talking about yeah. you know, like amateur competitions. But like, I, I get you need experience and sometimes you get propelled into the deep end and that wasn't ideal back then but now it's like you're having like multiple fights that are very very hard for no money which are the same rules so yeah. i don't also think that's the perfect way forward either yeah. it's like there's got to be a balance in between right well like, this this is the thing right so and yeah, i don't want to shit on amateur, amateur no, no, fights, but I, I think what you're saying is essentially because like when i was competing back then yeah the only amateur mma was basically pancreation um so that, that's that's what i was competing pancreation and I did. Uh, I think I might have done a, a couple of combat grappling ones with Luke Pizzuti from Lions Den. Yeah. Uh, when he was so, I think at the time he would have been promoting CFC, and then when he stopped CFC, uh, and I've got to get Luke on the podcast because it's, it's an interesting story. But like, he he went he went and decided, okay, I'm not doing CFC anymore. Uh, I'll run, you know, this uh, New South Wales NS, NSW AMMA. So New South Wales Amateur Mixed Martial Arts was what um, he had started, right? And uh, he ran a few events and I did a couple of those. And it's like, they were very, I guess, entry level in, comp in comparison to what else was available. Like everything else is basically you just straight into the scene, right? Like and nowadays, the amateur scene that we're seeing or that when you go to a show, an amateur show, and majority of the amateur shows that are being run are running, being run like professional shows. Some of them will even have professional fights on the same night. And it's pretty difficult to differentiate you know, between who are the amateurs and who are the pros if, if you're the everyday punter, right? Well, even for myself, like, um, it, it, like some of the, the shows I've seen in the cage, it's like they're kind of fighting in what looks like four ounce. They could be six. Yep. Um, there's no shin pads. But yeah, there's no, there's no shin, headgear. There's no headguard. So, yep. and what, they don't throw what, elbows? Yeah, so they don't and have how elbows. Many, <laughs> how many fucking pros can throw elbows? Like, like less than 10% know how to throw elbows in there because it's such a unique kind of tool, right? Yeah. Um, and a high level practitioners can land them because there's timing is, is different, right? Unless you come from a Muay Thai background. So yeah. they kind of emit a tool that not that many people are confident using anyway. Yeah. And the only other thing that's generally uh, uh, excluded is rotational leg locks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, less than 1% of submissions in the UFC are uh, from leg locks and foot locks anyway, so they don't work that well. <laughs> So I guess, you know, we can sort of segue a little bit and we might as well talk about Alta because that's what we've been out doing today. Um, and I think like part of the reason why, you know, I, um, when you guys started talking to me about coming over to Alta, like what excited me was that there's an opportunity here because, yeah, there isn't really a lot of novice, real true novice MMA competition, right? Like I think for anybody that wants to compete in amateur mixed martial arts, 
majority of the competitors now that I see at the shows and the shows that I've commentated, everybody's either fought kickboxing, had boxing fights or done jiu-jitsu comps. They've all done something before they've come into the cage to make their first war. Yeah. I feel like that makes it pretty daunting if you're somebody who's never done anything before to go and get into the cage for your first experience and you might be mashed up against somebody making their debut who essentially, you know, has a wealth of experience um, in, in these other disciplines and, and, and has had a history of competing. So, yeah. you know, I think that's one of the things that I liked about Alter in the sense that, you know, we're, the, you know, if you do the 20 week program and you complete that 20 week program and you, and you do want to do the finale and have your first experience in the cage, you know, you've had a really good chance to eyeball the talent and look at, okay, exactly where are you in your journey and trying to find you something that's going to be competitive, right? And yeah, it's going to be a good I mean, experience, right? Yeah, to your point about you got 100 sessions, so 20, 20 weeks, five months, you're looking at, that's consolidated, right? That's five days a week training. So your average person is training two, three times a week, whether they have their first amateur C-class fight, whatever. It's probably on aggregate, they've trained for a year to two years. Yep. We're kind of compressing that year training within um, five, five to six months, right? By the time they have that fight. But what you find is when you've got 20 weeks to look at people, especially as a coach, observing people, you really have a good idea of where they kind of stack up. Yep. We already started matching fights now for the finale. In a couple yeah, of suburban months, showdown. The Suburban showdown. Yep. So we'll start to kind of collate notes on those fighters, any past experience, any athletic experience, how they move, go eyeball them in the gym. So I think the matches are very equitable and fair. Shin guards, uh, referees, of course, are going to stop the matches pretty early if anything happens. Yeah. Eight ounce gloves. Eight ounce gloves. It's kind of as real as you can get without making it too dangerous. And I think when I first started with um, coaching any kind of Wimped Warrior Alta, um, I'd been invited in in 2013 to a season. Um, actually, funny enough, where I first met Nick Langton, who's the the uh, founder of um, of Alta. Yeah. And uh, I went there, coach, and, and before I kind of got to the session, I thought, oh, 20 weeks, like, how can these guys be fighting in 20 weeks? I must feel like I'm a fighter. <laughs> it took me longer than 20 weeks to try to get in the cage and rah, 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 rah. I got there and I saw what they were doing and I saw how the, the, the process and the journey for these people, chat to some of them, the outcomes that they've got from the training session, not just physically, but mentally, life-changing outcomes. Yeah. And then they're having an amateur fight at the end. I'm like, fuck yeah, everybody should have a fight. It's in a sanctioned, safe environment. They've done the basic training for 20 weeks under the watchful eye of the only the best MMA gyms and practitioners in the country at the time, Australia and Sydney. So fuck, why not? Yeah. I, I think everybody should benefit from having a fight. It's not some prestigious thing that you only can do if you train for years. No, that's not what these guys are. The, the outcome they want is stepping in to have their first fight. Yeah. They get a life-changing experience and... Um, at a, at a small price, right? It's, a, so it's I, the I, scariest I, thing that most pe anyone could ever do, right? Like, I think I think for most people, uh, their first experience walking, making that walk to the cage and realizing, hey, the door gets locked, and there is nobody that can help you in this experience. It's literally you and this other person. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's from that perspective, you know, some people might say, oh, that sounds so brutal. It's like human cockfighting, but. When you it's go through like an experience, it's like human fighting. It's like human fighting, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it, it's it's old as old as we are, and um, either embrace it in a sanctioned environment and let people do it who want to do it willingly, or fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think at, as a result of that, like you actually push yourself to this new level of really finding out what you're capable of doing. Also, what people don't understand who don't fight, and why I challenge everybody to to, to have a fight is. You have a different understanding for yourself that you will never have unless you step in there. And you don't understand what real adversity is in, in, the, in the literal sense of like, ah, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm panicked, I'm excited, I'm nervous, I'm going to die. And, and then the elation of, of finishing the event, not winning or losing, just finishing the event and seeing something in that other human that's across the cage from you that you never see in someone you walk past the street. Yeah. You just don't have that admiration, respect for someone you probably never had a conversation with sometimes and you just have this mutual respect for what you've been through together yeah now that's fighting in a nutshell for me and i think you just have to do it to experience that but i, I promise you there's levels in life and if you can get through that walk to the cage you'll be on the next level forward and then outside of the cage it's suddenly like little problems in your life seem like uh that's they're trivial like, now they're, they're, they're a little bit more trivial right yeah yeah all right so I, i'm sort of curious you know at what point did you then turn around to liam and dylan and say hey i want to go to the ufc like that's the goal was that, was that something that you worked out early on? Like, well, how many years I, into the I journey think, was that? I think secretly I'd, I'd had the ambition of fighting in the UFC forever, although I probably didn't kind of 
um, relay that to them. They, they kind of just thought, oh, I was just wanted to do a fight, and train MMA, right? But, you know, the boy inside of me was saying, I want to be somebody, I want to be in the UFC, I want to just, I want to be like that on that TV. Literally, I watched it, was obsessed with it. No one else I knew in my circle of friends or anybody really cared about it, particularly not my parents. Um, and, you know, like I started telling the story to people when I was 19, 20, I was like, oh, I want to, I'm, I'm training, I'm fighting, doing jiu-jitsu, doing, um, doing uh, you know, kickboxing, and I want to fight in the UFC, so yeah, that's what I'm training for. And people were like, you want to fight in the UFC? And, and back then it wasn't like, right now there's every event the UFC puts on in Australia, one million fans watch it, over one million fans. There's 800,000 people, 800, people that watch the Wallabies. Yeah. 100,000 people watch the Super Rugby on a weekend. So it tells you right now the UFC is much bigger. Back then I'd say it was, it was a very fringe sport. Yeah. So to kind of tell people that I wanted to fight in the UFC was almost like, seemed a bit outrageous, right? Yeah. So I think, um, and, and this is something that I could do more in my life now, is kind of tell myself what I want to achieve and do. That's to anybody, right? But back then I was very clear on that's what I wanted to achieve and I, I was going to manipulate things in my life to make that happen, right? Um, so yeah, I, I guess it was about 20, 21. Uh, when I was... 21, I, I finished, I went to my last university, my last year of university in Atlanta, in Georgia. And that was just post Robert Whitaker loss. I think I was 20 when I fought him. Yeah. I'd taken a little bit of time off. I was still training, wasn't fighting. Went to the, went to university in the, in the States, turned 21 over there. So I was kind of a bit like back to playing rugby for five months for something different. A little bit lost. I was three and one, I believe. Or I was two and one. No, three and one. I can't remember. I'd I'd, I'd, I'd had a couple of good wins. No, two and one, and then lost to Robert Whitaker in CFC. Yeah. Got back to Australia after my my year in the states. Sat down with my coaches and we planned a couple of fights. Said, so, look, I want to have another run at it. I'm 21 now. Let's get back in shape. I never really took it as seriously as I could. I took it seriously, but you know, it was peaks and troughs between yeah. fight camp. And going getting drunk for you know two months and, and doing and doing all the other things you do right so yeah we, we took a big run at it i think I, I i drunk probably i can count on my two hands how many times i've had alcohol in the next six years post that literally yeah. so you're very a lot more focused a lot more focused a lot more focused a lot less um distractions and bad habits right okay sorry just to go back on, on something like um so having shared you know, that experience with Robert Whitaker early on uh, and, you know, for your career and, and also, you know, when you sort of look at how his career has gone, um, what, how, do you, how do you reflect on that as well? Like, first of all, can you talk me through the fight? Obviously, I know you lost and that's probably always a sore point for any fighter, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I didn't know much about him at the time. We were both very young. Um, yeah, I mean, for CFC, took it on, I think, two weeks' notice. Didn't know much about him. I, I thought I was just like probably going to smash him, but um, I mean, I took him down like seven or eight times in the first round. Had a rear naked choke on in the start of the second round, everything like that. Kind of like was doing pretty good, um, but just kind of like gassed myself and then just got reversed from a top position butterfly straight, gave my neck straight up, rear naked choke. So I'd say the fight was pretty close. I'd say I was actually better than it, maybe not naturally at striking, I was a bit stiff then. But definitely way better at wrestling than him at that time, and um, and jujitsu as well, I'd say. Yeah. But just gassed out, got caught. Never wanted to go into a fight again, feeling like um, I wasn't fit, right? And I hadn't done the work. Just mentally, that would just weigh down on me. Uh, but now looking back at it, I mean, I guess I don't really give it that much thought. I mean, it's, it's it gives me a little bit more solace to be like, oh, well, least, he went on to be the yeah, champ. Yeah, went on so. to be the champ. Like, I mean, at the time, my friends like, ah, oh, you lost to the guy. You lost. I was like, yeah, but ah. Uh, I mean, he was better than I thought, you know, whatever. It's, fighting's fighting, right? Yeah. And, and I didn't have the maturity to, to take the losses back then. Also, just to, to kind of um, understand and, and, and really, like, I wasn't mature. I was 20 years old, right? It's like, and when I was 20, I was like some 15-year-olds. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I was like, yeah. still a real, a real boy inside my head. So taking that, that year after that kind of um, off, you know, and just focusing on my, on my, my studies, um, just gave me that kind of introspection about what that loss meant to me and what that meant to my ego, but then what that meant going forward. It's like there's two ways. You can use it, you can quit, or you can use it to propel yourself to um, 
to kind of take things seriously and go to the next level. And that's what I had to do. Um, and I'm just lucky that I had those coaches there. Yeah. Uh, you know, the boys at the gym, my training partners, um, and everybody around me. Like I, we had a very good group of people who were supportive, who were switched on, who were smart. Um, and, you know, I was never really um, caught up with anybody who was who was otherwise, and nor did I want to hang around anyone who wasn't aspirational, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So then, you know, when, when you decided, okay, I'm going to have this second run at it, uh, and then, you know, you took it very seriously, cut out all the alcohol, well, majority of the alcohol and any of the partying and all that no, stuff. No, I cut that out fully, yeah. 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 So I had, I had, I, I was um, two and one, I believe, or three and one, I forget what it was said. Um, had come back, started training again, I think it wasn't until I was 22 I was, or 23 then. Like I took a couple of years to actually hone my skills. I came back. I had a fight against a Brazilian black belt who used to run Grace, Gracie Oceana called, um, uh, I'm going to have a mental blank now, Adriana Magnani. He's actually now just working at Gracie Baja in Orange after being back in Brazil for years. But he was out here with Mario Yokohama, who now runs my BJJ. He was one of his black belt instructors. I had a fight against him in Gladiators, which was on uh, a, a Sydney show, which was run by Tama Tahuna and Jamie Tahuna. Um, so that was Gladiators. I fought on that show. I had a good finish on him. Um, I slowly started to in, improve my striking because for a long time I was very stiff, like very stiff, right? I'm still stiff, but like I was like robotic, right? Yeah. Um, and I did, I did improve my striking with Eddie Calabotti, who was a coach of mine at the time. Um, he got to that point where I was improving. After that, I went on to have a couple more fights and wins, um, you know, mostly local promotions. I fought Callan Potter in another show on out west, and I knocked him out with a, a, a knee against the cage from a 50-50 clinch. So that's when I was on a, a bit of a hot skid, and I was about a, a hot trot. Sorry, I was about 7-1. and one. So that's where I got to. I got to about 7-1. and one my pro record when I was 24, yeah. 23, 24, 23. Um, and that's when the Ultimate Fighter had come back to Australia for its second run. Because when the Ultimate Fighter first had come back, I'd had one of those fights on my second run. Yeah. So I was like four and one. And I was like a reserve. And they actually called me to go on the show. And I missed the call. And by the time I'd called back, they they'd, already, they'd already rang. Um, James Manicolo, they brought him on the show and he didn't make weight. Wow. Yeah. And that was the end of his career fighting. He was another guy from Elite Fight Gym in Penrith. Great guy, great great competitor, one of the best guys in the country at the time. But he got brought on, couldn't make the weight. But I missed that call. But missing that call was actually really good because I was one of the two reserves, obviously him and myself. Yeah. Robert Whitaker was on that season, Richie Bass. Uh, but it was it was kind of like, it was it was fate, right? I missed it. Went on to have a few more fights, get more experience, work my skills, work my weaknesses, develop, get seven and one, and then get the opportunity. Yeah, I still lost the semi final on the Ultimate Fighter, but got my opportunity then. Had a good first fight, um, you know, put myself in a good situation to uh, to get a contract, right? So yeah, that's that's kind of how it happened. So, so there was that break in between after that Whitaker loss, went on another win streak, seven and one and then got the opportunity for the Ultimate Fighter and that second tryouts. So, well, uh, talk us through the tryouts. Like, what do they make you do in the tryouts? Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blur the lines between the two, but more or less it was... Um, the first ones were the, the Hilton Hotel. We had a tryouts, but I'll just move on to the second one. We was at the new UFC gym in uh, Alexandria, I believe, in Sydney. We had a mixture of um, a grappling match, which was only a three-minute match, Randomly, they picked against someone else in the tryouts. Yeah. Um, and then they also had a, se a section where they had pad holders, and they were just watching you hit pads. Right. I actually had Tama Tahuna um, call pads for me, who, you know, like I'd fought on his shows. His brother, Jamie, obviously fought in the UFC. Great guy. You know, one of the good guys in the sport who, who helped out a lot of fighters on the way. So he held pads for me. Lucky I kind of knew him a little bit. So we kind of had a little, like, what do you want to do in the combinations? And then... So it was a, a mixture of a, a three-minute grapple where they just watch you compete against someone, just two guys going at once, pad work, and then an interview stage where you, if you got through that stage there, you would come into then the directors of the actual show or the producers would um, sit you down and uh, interview you about you know, your personality. And, and basically that was just to vet anyone to see if they, weren't, you know, if they were going to be either good on camera or not good on camera, I, I, I believe, right? So... 
I could string a couple of sentences together. And there's some guys that, you know, are very introverted and it wouldn't suit them. There's probably guys who should have made the ultimate fighter who are better than me or better than other guys that A, didn't have the personality, couldn't string a sentence together or had a criminal record or something, right? Yeah. And, and I've, I've got a couple of those guys in my head right now. I'm not going to say their names, but that's just how it goes. And that's like kind of for anybody coming out for a sport, you've got to, you've got to work on your weaknesses. Yeah. You've got to work on your weaknesses, you know? So then uh, when, you, when you get the call up and then they said, oh, you know, we want you on the second season of the show, like, I guess behind the scenes, you know, everybody can see what happens in the house and they edit it, you know, in a specific fashion to sort of drum up a little bit of drama and all that sort of stuff. But I guess, you know, for you in the, in the, in the house, like, what, what was that like? <laughs> Do you look back on it and go, that was, that was a shit time in my life or was it actually a lot of fun? No, no, it wasn't a shit time in my life. You know, I was single, no kids, uh, 24 years old. Uh, I got flown out to Canada. It was all pretty exciting, but also nervous, right? Because you get flown out with seven other Australian representatives, three other welterweights, I was one of them, and four middleweights, right? Yeah. And you meet these coaches that you've never trained with before. So Kyle Nope was there, Adrian Pang, who owns Integrated MMA. MMA. Yep, up in Brisbane. Uh, also for 1FC and, and many other uh, tournaments. And then we had, you know, some guest coaches. Uh, our jiu-jitsu coach was a guy called Roberto Tusa Alencar, who owns Gracie Baja, New Mexico, trains a lot of the professional fighters from Jackson's. Uh, so the standard of coaching was great. We had a wrestling coach, Izzy Martinez, Izzy style, Chicago. Also the Jackson Winkle John wrestling coach. Uh, Jackson Winkle John wrestling coach had coach John Jones, Holly Holm, etc. So the, the, the coaches were great. Um, the house environment was strange. You're in this big log cabin with you know the eight Canadians and the eight Australians. This big, sh- you know, we we'll had to order what food we we wanted in the in the freezer. When we got there, it was the weather was all right. It started to come into the cold season, and then you know, like there was snow. We'd never seen snow in our lives. We're out there with like, you know, thirty centimeters of snow. Training in the morning, training in the afternoon. It was half an hour to in the minivan, two training, half an hour back. Yeah, twice a day. You know, five to six days a week. Six days a week. It was like Groundhog Day. Like honestly, like after seven weeks of no tech, no technology, no phone, no internet. Eight dudes in a house, you don't know them. Minivan, half an hour, 40 minutes. Minivan back, two hours of training, twice a day. Man, it, it, it kind of grinds on you. You know, you can't speak to any of your family or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's one way to make friends really quickly or enemies. Um, so I made some really good friends that I'm still uh, close with, right, from that season of The Ultimate Fighter that you, you get to know very intimately over seven, eight weeks, right? Because yeah, you're yeah. in a house together with fucking nothing to do. Yeah. Had a hot tub out the back. Daniel Kelly used to always cook food for me. Um, you know, there's some great guys. There was actually one guy in our series, Tyler Manoraroa, uh, who's a Kiwi-born Aussie kid, uh, who was probably the most talented guy in Australia at the time. Yeah. I, I feel like his record might have been 12-0. and 0. He beat the top seed in, 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 in um, his first fight. Yeah. A guy from TriStar, Nordin Taleb, he beat him. Uh, man, he was 20 years old, probably the, the probably the best talent I've seen. And um, yeah, he lost. He lost to the guy who ended up winning it in the semi-final, but it was just a decision loss. And then after that, he, uh, he you know the UFC said we're never gonna we're never gonna pick this guy because he he made like a a meme. He put a meme up on Instagram from two years before that when he was a teenager. Um, it was something racial, right? But he considered himself black anyway because he's a, you know, he was a, yeah. a you know, because it's New yeah, Zealand, New Zealand. Island. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, so it just kind of got taken out of hand. But he was probably the most talented guy on the season. Um, he was one of Adrian Pang's guys, like phenomenal. Would have been great in the UFC. Just never got, the never, never got the opportunity. Never got the opportunity for something that he posted years before that somebody from that series and the Canadian team pulled up and used against him. Wow. <laughs> Cajun Johnson, actually. Um, which is we weird. just reignited some old beef. Yeah, it was just it was just weird. So like that was just like a massive. Uh, you now you talk about crossroads and and, and and things that didn't go. It was lies. Yeah. Well, it went well for me because I got an opportunity that perhaps I wouldn't have got had I could. You know, maybe I didn't put myself in the situation to speak on the camera or you know have those extra fights when I got back and make my record look good enough, you know? It's like there's multiple factors, right? You've got to make your kind of destiny. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there were kind of diverging moments where you, you either 
turned it into something or, you know, someone could turn it against you, right? Yeah. So for you, right, like, because uh, we were talking about this before that, by the you know, after the grind, right, by the time you came to the semis, you know, you're already pretty beat up from the process of yeah. going through the training. Well, I mean, like, my opinion, looking back on it, and I, and I think the guys just didn't know. They were just doing the best they could, but our coaches would train us, this is my opinion, um, two hours a day, two sessions, pretty fucking hard. Like, we're doing hard S&C like it was, you know, the hardest fucking sessions I've done. I was just absolutely rooted. Um, so, like, seven weeks of that, like, I think it took me two years to recover. I don't think I ever recovered after the that training cycle and then going on to fight camp to fight camp because uh, at some it, it screwed my whole endocrine system, like, the overtraining. I had, like, my testosterone levels dropped down to, like, a 90-year-old man. And I know other people in that season who did as well. I won't name names, but someone who was younger than me, whose testosterone dropped to like three nano, nano, nanomoles, right? Yeah. Um, or millimoles. So like, I had no testosterone, endocrine system absolutely F Tanked. Yeah. Tanked. Just totally tanked. Just like, like, worst feeling ever, right? And it took me three years to get over that. I couldn't get over it while I was fighting. I was just always fucked. Um, yeah, but we were training like two two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, and training like super hard. And and uh, that was the approach, right? Whereas the Canadians, when I spoke to Patrick Cote afterwards, he's like, oh, no, when my guys got here, I said, hey, you know, what do you guys do in your home gym? What do you want to do? Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? Okay, how would you like to train, you know, leading up to a fight? Because you might be fighting this week, you might be fighting in three weeks. So how do you want to cater your session a bit? Let's work around you guys. Well, we never had that conversation. We just... Which went uh, balls, sent balls wall. to the wall and yeah. uh, beating each other up. Yeah. Um, so it's just two different approaches. You know, sometimes it works for some people, sometimes it doesn't. You know, I obviously couldn't take that much volume because I'm not a big eater. You know, probably already fit and lean, so it was pretty hard on me. Hard to maintain the energy level, right? Yeah, and I'll always like I'll always keep the pace if that's what we need to do and that's what they're asking for. I'll go as hard as I can, right? Yeah. So yeah, that was that was hard. Um, so then you know when you so after you lost the semis, how did then the, the UFC come back to you and say, hey, we still want to offer you a contract. Yeah, I think Joe Silver came back to me and was just like, hey, you know, good work on the season. I want to offer you a, um, you know, fight in the finale card um, in Quebec, which was... Yeah, um, yeah. close spot, yeah. Yeah, in Quebec. So, French, so, so then, yeah, I did my camp in... I did my camp in Tiger Muay Thai, part of it. Did part of it here, did part of it in Tiger Muay Thai. Um, trained with... The eventual winner of the middleweight, Elias Theodora, pa Patrick Cote, who was a coach of the Canadian team. Yep. Um, Brian Ebersole was actually at Tiger at the time as a head coach. There you go. We trained together. Elias Theodora has since passed away, stage four cancer. Oh. Um, he, he went on to win the middleweight division and then win maybe won seven out of ten UFC fights. Very good record, but quite a... Um, a boring fighter, I would say. Like he, he, he wasn't. He was very tactical. Yeah, used to wrestle a lot. Didn't didn't knock a lot of people out. So he went on to do good things. Um, Patrick Cote went on to beat Kyle Noak in that. Michael Bisping actually was the headline for that of his first fight back since his eye injury, and he fought Tim Kennedy and lost. Mm. So that was the card that I fought on, um, and that was a wild experience. You know, um, just going to you know Quebec City in Canada with Liam and uh, Dylan, and uh, my, my dad came to that one. It was, it was pretty wild. Yeah. It was pretty wild, pretty good experience. And then, so, you know, from all the different places that you would have fought for the UFC, is there any, like, particular standout that you that you really reflect back on and think that was that was a cool experience? Yeah, in, in Japan, I think, was the coolest experience. Uh, so I had my first fight, won that one in Canada, and my next fight I got matched up in Saitama Super Arena in Tokyo, Japan, 2014, September. Um, so I'd improved quite a bit between those fights as well, continued to work on my striking with um, my coach Adam Higgins, who's more professional boxing style, um, and just got my, got my head movement, got my, my hands a bit faster, and um, so things started to look pretty good like that. Um, again, still developing from camp to camp. But that's a fight that stands out. It was just crazy because I'd watched a lot of Pride growing up. Oh, well, growing up in my teenage years and my later teenage years. I was a big fan of watching the old Prides. Yeah. Yoshido and, and all these ones. Shockwave, uh, the GPs. And um, so to fight in Saitama was like quite exciting. We had like you know, 
20 plus 30 guys from my gym in Chatsworth fly to Japan to watch. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, like, you know, people can say they have a couple of guys come watch their fight. I'm like, I literally had, yeah, 20 to 30 guys fly to Japan to watch us and hang out with us. Yeah. So that was pretty unique, um, fighting there. And it was such a, a visceral kind of fight because the crowd doesn't make much noise. You can yeah. hear the canvas bounce. You can hear the, you can hear the shots. Um, I had a, t- a, a really like a tough fight, which I, I believe I won the fight. It's a split decision loss, but I, I would say that I comfortably ran uh, one round and two, uh, two one, rounds. One, yeah. yeah, two rounds. I can't even speak. One and two. Yeah, and then I lost. A, I lost the third round, but for for some reason, unbeknownst to me, um, I lost. But that's fine. It is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. I don't actually look at, back at that with much remorse, right? About about feeling, you know, about anything that happened. Not that I did anything bad to feel remorse, but you know what I mean. And uh, then from from there, I kind of went on to fight in the the next fight. They gave me a winning match after that. The UFC like, we'll just give you a match like you won. So they gave me a guy called Alan Jovan, who just came off another split decision loss in Brazil against Vale Alves, who won the Ultimate Fighter. Which again. Everybody, everybody thought he won that, so they gave him a match against me in Los Angeles at UFC 184 on the main card. So that was the first time I'd been clipped as well. Got clipped in the temple, dropped, stumbled. Big John McCarthy finished that fight, but that was pretty. That was pretty trippy as well, being in Los Angeles, meeting Dana there, fighting. You know, I got an opportunity to be on the Joe Rogan podcast. Didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take it. So right, you're on the Johnny House podcast. Yeah, I know, I know. And here we are. Here we are years later. <laughs> so when it came, like, because you actually, you know, hung up the gloves relatively early. Like, you still had plenty of years left in your in your prime, so to speak. You're still probably only, you know, you're still in your prime now, really. But um, what was the, the motivation to decide, hey, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I've, I've, got, I've achieved what I wanted to do, which was to get into the UFC. And now it's time to look for a different challenge. Like, what? Uh, I feel as though... I, I wouldn't have it. I didn't have as much success as maybe I wanted, or maybe um, I needed to stay motivated. Yeah. Ups and downs. Uh, it's hard on your personal life, you know, when you have a partner and when you're trying to just manage, you know, day to day, because it's it's not a life of balance. Yeah. When you're when you're training two three times a day, and it's it's very much around uh, what you're doing. You know, what yeah. might, what, when I've got to eat, when I've yeah, got to I, train. I don't care what anybody says. Fighting is a is a very selfish endeavor. Right? Yeah, like, it is. People say, "I fight for my family" or "I fight for this." No, but you don't. When you're when you're doing it, and you know, if you if you're going to be serious about it, like everything else has to take second fiddle while you focus on fighting. Because oh, if I you want to give yourself the best opportunity to come home safely to your family, like I, I, I've I've talked about this a couple of times. I was saying this to Josh Coolbow as well because at the time he hadn't had his um his daughter yet. But I was saying, when you have your, your kids, that's going to change your life entirely. And, you know, Josh was always like, oh, I don't need any external motivation. I'm not saying you're going to need external motivation. But it becomes a different thing when you go away to compete. And when you say, you know, I love you and good night and daddy's going to be away for the next few days. Like, when you say goodbye to them, it really hits home that, hey, what if this, what if this is the last chance that I ever get to say I love you and goodbye? Yeah. Right? And people were like, oh, you're being dramatic. And I was like, no, 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 before I fought, like, that was, that's what I would do. You know, I went to my kids and I, they probably got the biggest cuddles and they're probably, they're probably thinking, why are you cuddling me so much, daddy? And I'm like, no, like, what if I fucking die? Like, what if something happens? Yeah, yeah. Right? And so that's why it's like, you know, when you're, when you're, if you're going to focus on competing, like, if you want to give yourself the best chance to survive, you have to make that the priority. And that's why it's, it's so difficult on family life. It's so difficult on people's personal lives. So... But that's what it would take if you want to keep operating at the highest capacity, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So then, you know, like when it came to making that decision, was it, a, did you talk to anyone or you just said, okay, no, I'm ready to... Uh, look, I've had, I've had ups and downs, ups and downs in motivation, ups and downs in my, my physical health from fighting even, uh, I wouldn't go so far as saying mental health, but that came after. I'd yeah. say I, I, I stopped by it because you go from... I think I've made them, my mind up that, you know, I, I, I'd given it a shot. You know, perhaps I needed to have more experience earlier on and I kind of got to the UFC a bit too early and that's what I wanted. Um, but then to stay in it is harder because you've got to keep winning, right? Yeah. So I kind of made that decision up that I, I think, well, I almost made that decision up for that last fight that I had in Melbourne. Um, and when I got to the fight, I'd, done, I'd still trained hard, done the fight camp. But when I was in the ring, I was just going through the motions. And I, like, I described it as, 
I, I wasn't as nervous for that fight in terms of um, the camp and getting ready because I did the work. But I was very nervous walking out. Um, and when I was in there, I didn't pull the trigger. I usually throw like, I had like the, in the, in the UFC at the time for three years or two years that I was in it until the last fight. I was in the top 10 for the strike differentials. So that means more, more strikes thrown than right, your yeah, opponent. Yeah. Also for the significant strikes landed per minute, top 10. So like a lot of those things and, and even maybe volume of strikes, right? In some, some instances, some fights. So I was throwing like half the clip. I just couldn't get my timing. I wasn't throwing. I was, something was off. And I, and I kind of was fighting not to win, but not get hurt. And I think that was the point where I was like, this just coincides with a bit that's going on. I think I just need a break from the sport. And, and my break from the sport was like all or nothing, right? Yeah. To kind of nothing almost. And, and it's been what? It's been seven years or something. I don't know. Yeah. Seven years? Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. And I haven't done much. I, I did a bit when I was work, obviously working with the UFC and coaching. I had to stay contemporary, but still not training as much as I should. So, um, yeah, I was kind of all or nothing kind of guy. Like, like an athlete, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like an athlete doing a job and not doing a job. Yeah. So once I got into the coaching, that kind of consumed my mind a bit in terms of coaching. But again, a job and work. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess, you know, before I, I do want to talk about your time at the USCPI in Shanghai. But before we get to that, uh, I'm really like, you know, we did talk about, well, you mentioned the, the mental health stuff after you stopped fighting, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, fighting, uh, it's all encompassing. So when you, when you stopped... Do you mind if I just check out a message? Yeah, yeah, do that. It's always interesting when you meet somebody new, right? One of the first questions that anybody asks is, oh, so what do you do for work, right? So it's like, this is why, I, and I find it interesting because I, I care less about what people actually do. I care, like, I actually care more about, okay, well... What are like, your hobbies? What are you Yeah, what, what are your, like, what, how, how have you gotten to this stage, right? Like, what are the experiences that you had? And... It's probably not an easy question to ask because, you know, everybody just wants to go by, oh, what does this person look like? You know, do they look successful? Uh, these are the indicators that we're using to judge where a person's at in life, right? Yeah. Um, but no doubt you would have had like a, a similar sort of experience to me when, you, when you've had something that's been such a big part of your life for such a long period of time. When you stop doing it, it's almost like you feel like you're a bit lost in terms of who you are as a person, right? Yeah, you definitely have an identity like crisis, right? When you go from... Hey, what do you do? I'm, I'm in the UFC. I'm in the UFC. I'm in the UFC. I fight in the UFC. I got stuff on. Someone's calling me about doing something to do with the UFC. I'm training for a fighting. Uh, I'm training a session in the morning, in the afternoon. I've got my teammate, my guys. Everyone knows I fight in the gym. I've got a certain um, title, and, and, and like the, my ego is entwined with uh, what I do day to day, right? Yeah. Which a lot, for a lot of people it is, right? Your identity. And then suddenly the rug's just been pulled from under you. You don't have a fight coming up. Suddenly you don't have the motivation to train twice a day because you don't have a reason to do it. Um, and then kind of getting yourself back into um, any routine because you have to build a new one. That you know this routine you've had for ten plus years is is, is gone. You know? So yeah, not to mention that you also have to work more, right? Um, so yeah, that that's definitely definitely tough, right? I say I just dealt with that from as as a matter of not expecting it, it happening, six months of kind of like pottering around and not knowing like who you are and uh, just not feeling good about yourself. And maybe you don't even know you're in that rut until people start going, oh, like, are you okay? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Like maybe there's some, I mean, there's definitely something that happens there when you, when you take away your routine you know, and your life seems to like kind of not mean as much. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have been in that situation, but it's kind of hard to describe unless you've been there, right? Yeah. Uh, so what, what, what helped pull you through? I don't know, man. I don't know. I think at some point you just got to fucking understand that you're in a rut and make a plan to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for me, it was, I was still coaching, luckily enough, and I was still coaching clients just in uh, personal training pads, this kind of stuff. And for me, it was an opportunity to uh, get into more coaching at the gym and then eventually from there get an opportunity to coach overseas. Yeah. Because um, I can't really answer that because it seems like that that six months after fighting is pretty hazy. Yeah. And, and perhaps um, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I, I didn't have any like tools to get over it, I think at the time, because I didn't quite know I was in it. Yeah. Um, so people start start telling you that kind of stuff. And then at some point you've just got to be like, fuck, I've never been like this in my life. I'm always like successfully chasing a goal. Yeah. Or have something that, that is a bigger picture thing. And suddenly I don't have that. So yeah, I just had to keep myself busy coaching. And then eventually I had some other things going on, like people fighting uh, opportunities to go overseas and coach. Um, and, and suddenly you kind of, those, those tables kind of turn. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I mean, t to tell you straight up that I had a, a solution to that, I, I'd be lying. I think that that was something I didn't know anything about. Yeah. Like uh, mental health stuff uh, till that situation, and I wasn't ready for it. Yeah, it's a, I think anyone that's gone through that, it is a, a pretty big rut, you know, like. Talking about like not getting out of bed, taking naps for like two hours in the middle of the day, just like watching like TV in bed, and you're like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Well, it's because, yeah, you put you place a lot of self-worth and value over this idea that this is what you've done, right? And I think, you know, I guess for me, realizing that, hey, you know, the phone was only, only ringing because I was holding a certain position, you know, you just sort of realize how hollow a lot of those experiences are, right? So, you know, the people that would call and they're only calling because they wanted me to help them with something in the car from the car industry, right? Yeah. Um, and look, you know, there was, I'm not saying that's everyone. There were plenty of people that would call and, and just sort of, you know, want to check in and make sure that I'm okay and what am I doing now? But, you know, majority of the people were just like, oh, you're no longer there. Oh, is there somebody else I can talk to? Like, it's conversations oh, like that. How are you, buddy? Yeah. So, so, you know, when you have conversations like that, like, I started to feel like, oh, this is, this is pretty hollow, you know? And so it's like, okay, where do I actually drive my self-worth from? Because if I'm going to keep driving it from this place that this is what I do for a living, well, I'm no longer that. So does that mean I'm worthless? Mm. Um, and so, so how do you value yourself? Like, yeah. is, do you value yourself on the experiences you've had, the so people you know, or yeah. what well, you do? Like, so I, okay, so I, th I think how I sort of pair it back is then the idea that you know we as human beings all being equal is the first sort of base layer, because that is not about what you do in life, that is not about, you know, the experience that you that experiences that you've had or anything like that. That is just purely the fact that by being alive, you have some kind of intrinsic value. Right? And whether that value and and I guess it goes this goes into a bigger question in terms of like faith and spirituality, right? But like whatever it is that you value, well, you have a base value as a person, right? And that's why we'd say like, you know, it's not right to kill another person because it, if they have the same sort of value as you, you wouldn't want somebody to kill you. you know, that's, the, that's where the idea of morality comes from because you wouldn't want to do things to other people that you wouldn't want done to yourself. Yeah. Right? Treat everybody how you want to be treated. And so, you know, like it made me reflect a lot on the fact that, yeah, like a lot of um, society really focuses on material things simply because that's what's easy to see. You know, I can't really go and uh, look at Richie and understand that, you know, apart from looking at your ears to know that, there's been a lot of sacrifice and effort put in to get to where you are today. Yeah. Right? Instead, you know, most people are looking at, okay, well, how's this guy dressed? What's the car that he drives? Where do they live? You know, what's their family situation? Yeah. What's their work situation, right? But people treat you differently. And one thing I noticed is like, when I was in the US or I was in Australia, when people find out, like you're talking to them and then suddenly they find out you're in the UFC and they, they start to look at you differently and talk to you differently. And it's like, it's human nature a little bit. It's like, oh, this guy's done something. Suddenly I have a respect for him. I didn't respect him before or something yeah. like, yeah. you know, or I'm not as engaged with him before, um, which was a, was a good insight to human behavior, right? It's the same way you just said people are ringing up because they want something, because yeah. they know you got something or they know you can help you're at a certain level. They can, yeah. oh, you can help me, right? And I get that. That's kind of human nature, but it's, you know, I think there's something to be said about the people that are with you the whole way. And I don't mean toxic people. I mean, just like good people that are with you before and after, right? Yeah. Or, you know, they're, they're the people that you need to hang around or you need to stay around. And that's, for me, that's like coming back to, I've kept my good mates, my good mates, and I've got acquaintances and people that I will always be in contact with, but I've kind of capped out on uh, who I want in my life and who I need because 
otherwise I, I just don't have the, the capacity to uh to even give my friends sometimes the time they deserve right yeah and that's just me because i'm disorganized or whatever it is but you know like you, you've got to value those relationships of people who are who are genuine and who um who are in your life because they they just want to be in your life right they don't want to be in your life for any any reason besides you know they love you yeah yeah so i guess you know when it came to then you so you added more coaching and sort of got yourself busy again um how did the opportunity to then go and coach in, in China come up? So obviously, so you went there to work at a, at a friend's gym before actually going for the PI, correct? Yeah, correct. So there was a, a, a guy, Davey Wei, who was um, born in China, raised in Australia, a uh, friend of mine from the gym who opened up a jiu-jitsu and, and kickboxing or MMA academy in, um, in Shanghai. And he, he actually had a coach um, already lined up for this job who was an American um, who pull the pin and, and uh, at, at the last minute. So we were actually just talking and he said, hey, you know, how would you think about coming to China for three months? I was like, oh, well, I've never thought of going to China in my life, you know, like not even on a holiday. But um, let me just talk to my wife about it. So we caught up, we had dinner, and we went out with, with um, David and Sandra, his, his wife. And, uh, yeah, we were just chat, chatting. He said, you know, like, I've had a coach pull out. Would you like to come to Shanghai and, and, and coach jiu-jitsu, maybe some MMA? I said, okay, sure. And at the time, I this is 2018. I think I just got my black belt the year before or 2018, around then, um, in, in jiu-jitsu off Liam Reznikov. So I thought, okay, sure, I'll go over. And I'm, I'm not really that experienced as a jiu-jitsu coach, and I never really have, and I don't think I ever will be a <laughs> jiu-jitsu coach per se, not yeah. to say I can't coach it, it's just not my wheelhouse. Um, so anyway, I took this on a whim. We got our visas, which is hard. If, if anybody's been to China, you know, getting visas is pretty hard. Got over to China um, and it was a massive, massive culture shock uh, coming from Sydney to China. Just, just the sheer volume of people there <laughs> trying to find and do anything. And lucky I had David and a few people there that he introduced me to to help me on the way. But yeah, it was a massive culture shock and, and, and a great experience. But it kind of just like landed me two feet in the deep and we didn't have, I didn't have time to think about you know, anything else. Myself and, and uh, my wife were kind of living there. And it was, it was really hard for Dara at the time because she's you know, stuck in an apartment for most of the day while I'm at work. Um, you know, and, and kind of twiddling her thumbs a bit in Shanghai, not knowing the language or anybody there. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of a leap we took just to see if that kind of led to anything else, right? Um, I'd, the three months turned into six months and then a year. And at that time, I said, that's it. I'm going to come back to Australia. I had an opportunity to, to coach at a, at a big um, gym in Melbourne and um, was working out a contract with the owner of that gym to coach their, their MMA fight team and amateurs. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I was going to head back to Melbourne. My wife was keen at the time. We said, let's go to Melbourne. Let's let's move down there. Another one, let's, let's go on a whim, see if we can make something of it. And then I'll open up an, an MMA gym as well yeah. um, on the side. And what ended up happening was that that fell through. At the same time, I had a, I had a, a Facebook Messenger um, message from a guy called um, Peter, who is the, the uh, he's now the SVP or, or vice president in China of, the UFC, right? I oh, know. Sorry, he's not. He's not SVP. He's, he's just a uh, director um, in, in China. And uh, Peter Jung is his name. He's also the translator. If they do any English to Chinese translation in, in, in the octagon, he also commentates for the Chinese, Chinese, language. Chinese, Chinese language. Right. So he's quite a well-known guy. He. I didn't know who he was at the time, but he messaged me on, on Messenger saying, "Hey, Richie, I'm trying to get a hold of you, Forrest Griffin. My name's Peter. I'm from UFC China. We know you've done some work over here." Uh, we were recommended you by you know Uriah Faber, and now um, oh, Forrest is trying to reach out to you. Okay. I said, okay, this is a bit random. Okay, here, call me on 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 Facebook Messenger. I started speaking to Peter. Okay, he's like, here's Forrest's number. He's going to call you. So Forrest calls me. He's, hey, you know, we're trying to recruit um, people for the new um, UFC PI. Um, and actually, let me rewind. Let me rewind. So when I first got to China to 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 help coach at Davies Gym. Um, Uriah Faber actually called me up and he goes, oh, I see you're in China. You know, I, I, I trained at Uriah's gym a bunch. I knew him, I knew all the guys from the gym there. Yeah. Um, and he said, look, 
I've been tasked with a contract to arrange the coaching team for the UFC PI. There's a second iteration of the Vegas one that's going to be the headquarters for the for UFC Asia. It's also going to be where we recruit all the talent from around Asia and we put them, we house them, feed them, train them at the Prawns Institute. And they have technical coaches, unlike the US facility, which is just auxiliary coaches, strength and conditioning, yeah. nutrition, dietetics, and uh, physiotherapy, right? But yeah. this one's going to have technical coaches, wrestling coaches, striking coaches, boxing coaches. I said, oh, okay. Wow, that sounds really cool. Are they going to spend 20 million US dollars building it? Wow, really cool. <laughs> When's it ready? Oh, it's, it's going to be ready soon. Don't know when it's going to be ready, but because we work together and we have a relationship, I'd love to get you involved. I said, cool. We had this conversation for 45 minutes in a cafe. My wife's sitting there. Like, Who is that? So I see Ryan Fabi saying he's got he's recruiting the coaches for the UFC Performance Institute China. It's going to be run by a contract by Alpha Male. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Didn't hear anything back from him till I got that message from Peter about Forrest trying to contact with me. So it turns out that Uriah had just kind of um, said, look, like I'm... It's too hard. Yeah, it's too hard. Um, not too hard recruiting, just too hard whatever his involvement was managing. So he, he, he'd given his recommendations of a list of people to uh, Forrest. Forrest had picked it up. Forrest contacted me. Um, at the time, I was still in China, but I was leaving and I was going to sign the contract with a new gym in Melbourne. And move my life to Melbourne, Shanghai to Melbourne. Well, I'd be still in Melbourne, far out. <laughs> and then, uh, so what happened was, I spoke to Forrest. He goes, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly out to Hump Shanghai to meet you." Uh, okay. So in rocks Forrest Griffin to uh, Refuge Martial Arts, where I'm coaching. He's dressed up all nicely in like a, you know suit pants and stuff. He's got a diary, a leather bound diary. I'm like, "Oh, Forrest Griffin, how are you, man? Big fan. Watch the first you now Ultimate Fighters. So, yeah. What a legend." Come in, we have a coffee at Starbucks, Shinbaka. Uh, we, have a, we have a coffee at Starbucks. We talk about, you know, coaching and philosophy and just, just like general chit-chat as martial arts get together, uh, martial art artists get together and we just talk about fights. Let's talk about stuff. We get along really well. Um, I show him the gym and I just like throw it out. I'm like, do, do you want to do, do, do some training? And like, meanwhile, I, I don't really realize that Forrest can't lift his arms above his head and he doesn't train properly anymore because he's just hanged up, yeah. right? And he's just like, I'm like, you want to train? Do some training? And he's like, yeah, let's do some training. You got any clothes? Give him some clothes. We're, we're just downstairs just absolutely smashing each other, doing no-gi rounds, cage work. And we're just having a good time, right? We train. We get along well. And he's like, all right, hey, it was good to meet you. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Um, you know, you'll hear back from me. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I hear back, uh, uh, like, you know, I don't know, within a month, I suppose. And... Um, it's Forrest and the guys, Duncan French, is the director of performance in, uh, in Las Vegas, right? And, and, they, and they get on a call and they want to bring me out to Vegas for an interview. And, and basically, they fly me out from Shanghai to Vegas for the weekend. In that interview, they want me to present how I would coach, how I would structure a fight camp. And then Forrest wants me to take a session at um, Syndicate Mixed Martial Arts. So he said, take a striking session. Okay, cool. So I went out to the, the, the institute in Vegas, had a, um, you know, just a PowerPoint presentation of, you know, like how I'd run a flight camp, how I'd structure it, how it was loosely periodized, and you know, what I would do in terms of training load. And it was pretty simple, but they could tell straight away that I kind of understood a little bit more about that side of it. Yeah. And I was thinking like that. Um, and, that, and, and then I went on to coach that class and I just did some Dutch drills at, um, at Syndicate. I'm just trying to think who was in the class. There was some, there was some interesting guys in the class at the time. I mean, um, Joe, the Scottish girl, was in the class. But yeah, there's a few other guys that would come back to me as I go. But that was good fun. So Forrest drove me around, hear back from him. You know, like basically by the end of the trip, they're like, yeah, we'd like to offer you like an, a, the assistant MMA coaching role to uh, a guy which we've hired, but we can't tell you who it is yet. So that's how I got the job, and that's where it kind of landed me in Shanghai for three years. So a contract and a half until I resigned. Yeah. Um, learning under Dean Ambersinger, who the head coach of Michael Bisping, the regional ultimate fighter in Australia. I had a rugby background, worked for the international um, English rugby team for tackling. Also worked in Japan for rugby for tackling. Um, had fought in the ultimate fighter himself. And worked with like a lot of UFC fighters and ran Rough House with Dan Hardy in in the, in the UK. Yeah. Um, so experienced guy, had had a science background, 
was very well um, versed in, in, you know, kind of putting things pen to paper. Yeah. And I learned a lot from him just about structuring fight camps, bucketing sessions, and running it a bit more like a professional team when you have 30, 40 people in in the room, right? So yeah. that's where I learned a lot from him, just observation, you know, on the technical side of it. He was very documented, um, very rehearsed. You know, everything was written down and scalable, right? So yeah. if he was away, I knew the, the templates for every session we were running and the format of off-camp and... Um, and fight camp and, and which which guys we had everyone numbered we obviously knew their names we had everyone numbered from like you know one to 40 and they just got that number and they had that number so if we were spying it's like 30 12 10 8 6 like 10 versus 8 we had all the matchups on the board all the numbers everyone just had a number because when we combined them we first brought them in they each had just a number so we just write down the number number rather than the name so yeah we just had everyone bucketed into you know on the s and c four everyone bucketed into uh, what their strengths and weaknesses were for the afternoon sessions. The morning sessions were all combined, um, pretty generic type sessions in terms of wrestling, you know, sparring, whatever. They were the morning two hour blocks and the afternoon was the more uh, specific stuff that might be tailored a little bit more to their strengths and weaknesses, yeah. depending on if they're in fight camp or uh, off camp. You know, Generally off camp, you're working a little bit more weakness based stuff or improving upskilling. And then fight camp, I'd say you're generally working more game plan specific, but more about your strengths and weaknesses and less about new skills and skill acquisition. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of what I did then for three years till I come back to, to work for, Al, for Alta. Yeah, Here we are sitting in the car. Yeah, wow. So, you know, because uh, MMA is still a, very much a growth sport. I, I guess it's a growth sport worldwide, but like, I guess in terms of like China and Asia in general, uh, did you find there were were they much were they far behind in terms of where the Western world is in terms of MMA? Uh, yes and no. Like I, I mean, they're still making um, they were still doing things. I won't say making mistakes, but they were still doing things that were just um, you, you see common in any gym, right? If if you don't if you don't correct them, just making bad decisions within sparring rounds, which ultimately lead to bad decisions within fights. Uh, training very kind of um, separate in their styles and not combining them well enough. Yeah. So the transition between ranges, i.e., you know, punching into takedowns, which I call fit-ins, um, the anti, anti-clinch anti stuff, you know, or the anti-wrestling stuff, or the uh, wrestling into takedowns into ground and pound or get-ups, all those kind of transitionary areas were pretty weak, um, whereas they had good rounded skills in, like, generally in striking, good, good wrestling, Jiu-Jitsu was a little bit of a weakness for, I'd say, you know, 80% of them. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, most of them were still kind of blue belt level. Um, but I'd say that was their weakness, if anything. Their wrestling was quite good and their striking was quite good. Because we had a, a, a majority of people that were, um, well, probably 50-50, you know, wrestlers and strikers. We found it easy to mould a game around uh, striking punching into takedowns when needed top position ground and pound and from the bottom get ups, no, no submissions, less of a focus on jiu-jitsu because we just went, look, there's, there's many different ways you can run a game, but if you're going to run a certain style that fits this group, that's probably the highest efficacy for winning fights with what we have and the time we have, it's probably this style. Yeah. Striking based, anti-wrestling, takedown on my terms, top position ground and pound. If you do end up on the bottom, scramble up, not going for submissions. That was kind of the yeah, gist. Yeah. Really, really good cage wrestling. Worked a lot of it. Um, and just, yeah, just fundamental basics repeated, 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 repeated. So we'd always come back to the same stuff in the syllabus in three week meso cycles, you know? So. so when it came to, so when you talk about meso cycles, so what Richie's talking about is the periodization of the training, right? So yeah. basically, you whatever know, block you can have like blocks of training right and we had a meso cycle of three weeks um three weeks of training you know and and in that three weeks for example it might be off camp might be three weeks of uh, general prep so we'd have a moderate week a high week and a low week being a deload and then we'd move to the next cycle which would be specific prep in off camp and it would be the same a moderate a high and a low so we could have an undulating uh, training load and volume and, and we do that in skill acquisition as well because the general prep you'd be primarily focusing on individual techniques moves more emphasis on the details around them and then when we got to the next phase of specific prep would be 
usually combining those in those ranges like we talked about. Yeah. Uh, and it would be more specific to the transitions. Uh, for example, in general preparation, um, we might be learning a single leg and it's more about the details of in a wrestling scenario, how you set it up, your grip, your finishing position, etc. In the specific prep, it might be combinations into single leg, two finishes. We're not focusing on the finish and the single leg itself as much as the transitions into it and how you would set it up. Yeah. So it becomes more specific. Um, and then when we talk about mesocycles in terms of volume, for example, at the, at the most basic level I could give you, and, and this is just, the numbers are arbitrary, but let's say in the, in the, um, the three week block, and we go moderate, high, low, moderate might be three rounds of sparring, high might be five rounds of sparring, and low might be one. You know, so then there's more emphasis on technical drilling in the low and less emphasis on live rounds yeah. as, a, as a ratio to each other. And in the high, there's more live rounds and less drilling. So the time that you're actually going live in the session is more in volume. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So when it came to like, you know, identifying what are the parameters for the mesocycles and things like that, was that all done before you or was that like something that then you've you've had to pick up in terms of the research or what was going on in that on that from that, that was just how we run it i mean there's different ways people run that cycle some people do four week blocks um that was just one that we went with that we found worked in well with our scheduling okay and, and based around the, the 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 wrestling use the wrestling it was kind of like the key link in our syllabus so we would just run and, and look other people do it in different ways yeah but we would just run a single week block that's single leg block double leg block and a body lock block so uh, they were the focuses in those weeks and we kind of we would um schedule every kind of thing around that so that's how we ran it so yep. single double body single double body there's it so that we'd, we'd be coming back each time yeah um and then we just use that as the link the wrestling is the kind of conduit between uh you know the shoot boxing and the and yep. the, the ground and pound etc and then, so when it came to finding these athletes, like where, how did the UFC find these athletes? We, uh, we found them. Well, a mixture of uh, Peter Jung, who was, I was just telling you before, works for the UFC. Yep. Obviously, he commentates the UFC, but he also commentates Wuling Fung, which is WLF, Wars, Big Show in China, Kunlun Fights, um, JCK. There's some big shows over there. They basically have most of the talent pool fight on these shows. Yep. So Peter had a, a very... Um, close touch point to who were good fighters in the country. We had a list. Myself and Dean, who, were the head, who, were the head, who was the head coach, we would travel around the country to Beijing to all the top gyms. Beijing top team. You know, we'd go to Zhengzhou. We went to um, everywhere, everywhere around the country. Tibet, you know, not, not Tibet. Sorry, um, uh, mental blank out west. Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang, yeah, Xinjiang. Everywhere we went out west. We, we checked out a lot of gyms. I just got a mental blank. This is what happens when you've been on the road with Johnny. Um, yeah, and we just eyeballed a lot of people. Went yeah. to the gyms, met the fighters, watched them train, watched them spar. Myself and team went around with like a clipboard, basically took some videos of guys sparring. Like, you know, what's your, hey, what's your name? Oh, I just saw this guy. What's your name? Oh, you with 1FC? I don't worry. Um, <laughs> and, and we ran around and we got a list of 50 people to come down and try out. Flew them all in, paid for the tickets and accommodation. Ran them through a battery of tests, some physical, uh, some technical, and uh, watched their fight tapes. Sat in a big room with Forrest Griffin, myself, Dean, a few other guys. Watched, yeah, watched all their fights. Looked at their records on tapology. Eyeballed them in training. Tested them: strength, physicality, anthropomorphics, measurements, speed test, reaction tests, uh, isometric mid-thigh pull, so maximum strength. Uh, wrestling drill, which we put together, grappling test, which we put together, and a striking test on the bags, uh, using some sensors to see their power and, and volume of punches. And then from that, we could kind of go, my primary kind of um, uh, indicator of how good they were was, of course, fight record, uh, and just kind of eyeballing them, coach's eye. And then I would say I used the data that we got as objectively as we possibly could. Um, as a maybe as a last kind of resort, I've had a couple of guys close to you know, so we could pick 20 guys in the first combine and we had 50 tryouts. If between number 17 and 25 was pretty close, I'd probably use the um, the data that we had to kind of um, give me an idea of who I would put in, who's worked harder, who's come in better shape, who's got more potential. You know, there's so many factors, right? Because we're giving them a full ride. That's right. Are there any, were there any sort of um, funny characters that you, you, you got to meet? Or- 
guys who were doing like all sorts of crazy shit? Not, not particularly in terms of the moves they were doing. I'd say that like most of the guys were um, either from Sanda background, some were from traditional, but like most of them had already transitioned to Sanda or they had come from wrestling background and wrestled in like the national team and stuff. So they were, they were, they were further, like we'd got guys who were already five, six, seven fights um, in their pro career. So we weren't seeing as many guys, uh, we, you know, to get to that stage and have a winning record, they probably had trained some sort of striking and some sort of wrestling. Yeah. So we, we didn't see anything too weird or wonky. Um, for the most part, the style was good. I think like technically they're quite good at striking. There's some good athletes, especially for the lighter weights. Yeah. So. Would, um, what, what about uh, Dung Wei Li? Would she use the PI at all? She's used the PI. I've done a couple of sessions with her. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 what do you think makes her special as an athlete? Uh, well, she's a very good athlete. She's a, she's a 10 out of 10 in terms of how quickly she learns. Yeah. If you show her something, she has the ability to replicate it. Yeah. And, and, and implement it. Also, I used to have a student in China who was a black belt in Jiu Jitsu. She, she won, she placed in the Los Angeles IBJJF, a purple belt in the gate. Good grappler, competent competitor. And I watched Zhang Wei Li just, just like go even with her and get the better of her time after time. Wow. Get top position, couldn't take her down. This girl was in the national judo team. So Zhang Wei Li's well rounded, good grappling, great striker. She's got power for her weight, of course, great fitness and, and very robust, but learns quickly and, and has a really good attitude. So, like, she's the right combination of yeah. natural aptitude and skill, fitness and power, mindset and ability to learn and, and, and apply that. Yeah. So, like, talent I mean, meets hard work. Talent meets hard work. I mean, look, to be, if I'm being perfectly honest, there was a lot of stuff that Zhang Wei Li had done in her strength and conditioning and her camps that aren't predicators of someone being successful in the sport. They're just random stuff. Um, she did MMA pads with Dean Amersinger, the head coach. You know, punch, 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 into a takedown on the pads, ground and pound, get ups. After that session, she was already the champion. After that session, she said, that was really cool. I've never done pads that are MMA pads. Yeah. Mixing in the wrestling and the takedowns. So pads. that just goes to show you kind of what they're doing, you know. Um, it's very segmented Muay Thai, hitting pads, wrestling, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu. But great athlete. Again, so if you ask me, like, do you need to be doing all these high-level um, drills? I would say ideally, yes, because there's guys who are going to come to your gym or girls who have the potential to make it to the UFC or to make it to a tunnel or a local show and be decent, and that might be their peak. And yeah. I think the best chance you've got them in expediting them get in there is doing the right drills and doing MMA pads and doing MMA drills and yeah. having safe sparring, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's the people like Jung Wei Li who just train hard and maybe they've done you know a thousand things that are redundant, but she's still the champ. Mm. I, I can look at some things that she does in training and go, that's just like total. Crap. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, but she's the champ. Yeah, so it's worked. So like, yeah, it, it's kind of that's what made me change my perception of not not that exact moment, but I, my perception of how much a coach actually has on making you the champion is a little bit different to some people. I think some people put a lot of weight on themselves as being that guy. You just got to get out of their way and not fuck them up. Well, I think I think we're good coaches. And, and with any athlete, right, like if you're a serious athlete, you need to have that level of personal accountability because at the end of the day, nobody's going to be able, be able to hold you accountable for your diet or your sleep discipline or your work ethic other than you, right? So I think, you know, ultimately you could have the most talent in the world, but if you don't apply any of those disciplines, like, you know, it's the same thing like when I, when I, when I was talking with Reed, right? I didn't, we didn't end up talking about, you know, what are the, what's the best way to do a weight cut or anything like that? Because the reality is, you know, Reed's spoken about that stuff a million times and he's got published papers on it. Like if you want to be accountable and, and understand what the best science is, go back and have a look and have a read of his papers. Like he's talked about, you know, weight cutting for Olympic athletes, which has become the basis for majority of the weight cut protocols around the world. Yeah. Right. 
So there's no real benefit in me trying to provide somebody with like this silver bullet that, hey, you know, you do this and this is how it's going to magically make your weight cut uh, somehow better. But like there's definitely things that people should be reading and understanding for themselves to know, okay, what's actually the real science and what can be applied and what are the, you know, and, and like Reid agrees, is like, you know, if you do the basics well, you can go very, very far in a sport because most people don't hold themselves accountable or have the discipline to yeah. stay doing the basics well for extended periods of time. I agree. I'd say 90% of the way there is showing up to the sessions, putting the work in and knowing what you're good and not good and need to improve on, like, and being honest to yourself, right? Some self-directed kind of um, learning and coaching, but also having the right people around you who are good mentors who are going to keep you accountable as well as keeping yourself accountable. That's 90% of it. The 10% is like the training partners, the coach, the atmosphere, your personal life. It's like, yeah, those things all play into it, but you still got to show up and be at the gym. Like, that's the fundamental main thing. You know? Yeah, like, it's like, you know, it's just so much worse. Yeah. I mean, I worked with a guy over there who'd, who'd, who'd like accumulated 13 gold medals in when he worked for the Chinese Olympic team. Um, <laughs> You know, coaching, um, and, and, and he always said to me, he's like, Walshie, you know, I ran all their S and C in the gym for them. They won 13 gold medals. Everyone thinks I'm like, you know, the bee's knees. He's like, if my grandmother was coaching those guys, mate, they would have won 13 gold medals. Yeah. He's like, they had the best of the best of the best. <laughs> like, you know, there's only so much. He was just like the cherry on the top. Basically, he was just keeping them getting injured yeah. so they could win. Uh, you know, so like S and C coaches love to like you know get involved with mate. Like your job is the one percent. Your job is keeping them on the mats training. Yeah, giving them that little keeping bit of an edge. Yeah. yeah, keeping them healthy, injury prevention, all sorts of stuff like that. Like people just kind of get a bit ahead of themselves. Like don't get me wrong, like you're important, but I, I just believe that talent at that top top echelon is. Um, there's almost a lot of, it's, it's inherent. Yeah, it's the 80-20 rule. 80% is already in the athlete, right? That 20% edge, that can be found from maybe the team and the people around them, right? For sure. Um, I guess, let, let's just talk about this as the last thing because, you know, we've, we've covered plenty and there's plenty for people in this. But, uh, you know, for you, and I, and I, and I know you always, used to, you always used to, you know, go out and get other influences and find, you know, different sparring partners and training partners and, and that sort of thing, right? Um, I'm just a little bit curious in terms of your mindset, you know, when it comes to when you see a lot of these athletes coming through and, you know, how should they approach that sort of personal accountability when it comes to trying to get, you know, new looks and new, new ideas in their own training? Like, do you think that's an important thing or do you think that's, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do think it's important, but I think at some point you've got to ask yourself, like, am I still got a lot to learn off, off who I'm with? And, and, and you might not, but you keep them around because, um, your loyalty coaches and, and yeah. they're good for you to make you a better person, right? Um, but at some point you've got to upskill and that might mean incorporating other coaches into your training or other training partners uh, or going to other venues to get different looks and different training, right? That's just part of the game. And I think you, you can be stagnated by staying in one place um, as much as you can by flip-flopping and going to, 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 to many different places. So what I would say to people is like, Leaving your gym and going to someone else because you think it's better isn't always better. Mm. Um, you know, but having a discussion with your coach about where your strengths and weaknesses lie and with yourself, I think you can probably know. And if you don't know, you're never going to make it. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to be self-critical about what you need to get better at and you need to take that upon yourself. No one else needs to, it's not no one else's duty to do it for you. Yeah. And um, in terms of training, you've just got to show up. Like literally the days that you get the, the most out of training are the days that you don't feel like training. Um, and and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. Like there was days where um, well, there's times when you just want to hit pads and you're doing stuff that just makes you feel good because it's nice and it's fluffy. Yeah. But really, you know, when you're in your off camp cycle, for example, when you don't have a fight coming up and you don't have one booked is when you should be really taking that time to invest in longer training sessions where the, the tempo and the, the output isn't as high but you're spending more time on repetition and learning new skills, skill right? Development, yeah. Skill development. Because, you know, like for people like me, I'm not the fastest learner, so you need to be learning, learning, learning the skill, practice, 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 implementation into training. I think when you don't have a fight coming up and you're not stressed about just winning rounds and being competitive, 
you shouldn't try to be as competitive. I mean, be be mildly competitive, but you should be trying to learn. Yeah. So I just say that my, my biggest piece of advice is off camp, learning versus winning, fight camp, winning versus learning. Yeah. So put yourself in those off camp situations where you can upskill. Go out to new coaches, sure, but learn to implement them. And you know where your weaknesses are. And if you do have weaknesses and you're in off camp and you're not practicing and you're not upskilling in your weaknesses, you're only lying to yourself. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I guess we'll end on this point because uh, I've heard Richie talk about this concept and I, I, I really like it where it's like, if you think about, you know, what, what your, uh, if you think about a triangle, right? And in terms of a, an athlete's development, the bottom layer, yeah. <laughs> so the bottom layer of that triangle, you know, especially when you're new, should, should always be about skill acquisition, skill development, right? Yeah, new techniques. New techniques. And then by the time, uh, as an athlete, you know, then when you start to, uh, like, if you have new techniques and, and skill and technical development down the bottom, up the top will be, you know, game planning and tactics. It's actually a very small part when you're new to the sport and you've got so much to learn. But then over time, as you, you know, develop those skills and those, those baseline techniques, when it comes to preparing for fights, you actually invert that triangle and then you spend a lot more time at that top layer, which should be, so the biggest layer of, of an thing about inverted triangle is now spending majority of the time in the game strategy, plan. game planning, yeah. tactics, yeah. and less on the, on the um, learning new techniques. The new techniques. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I like great point to finish on. Think of the triangle. Like you spend the majority of your time when you first start as a white belt of sorts in MMA, learning new techniques, skill acquisition. You go up through that triangle where you know your time is getting smaller spent on tactics, game plans, feints, fakes, traps. You know all that stuff at the at the apex, right? But yeah, like you said, as you get more experience, you're spending the more time on the on the nuanced things, right? Game planning the little micro movements, the angles off the center line, all these things become much more important than just learning the jab cross, right? And and uh, I think you just gotta know where you are and what you need to do and be accountable. Yeah. All right, well, if you wanna find Richie, it's uh, at Rich UFC. That's it. And uh, yeah, see you guys.